Good afternoon. The time is four o'clock and we are calling our meeting of November 14th, 2023 to order. Roll call vote, Sam. Trustee Anderson. Here. Trustee Crane. Here. Trustee Wigan. Here. Trustee Pearson. Here. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Ursoilu. Here. Trustee Bartow. Here. Dr. Smith. Here. Okay. Next is our adoption of the agenda. Do we have a motion? So moved. Moved by Trustee Weigand. Second. Seconded by Trustee Crane. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Weigand. Yes. Trustee Pearson. Yes. Trustee Murphy. Yep. Trustee Soilu. Yes. Trustee Bartow. Yes. Great. The vote was 7-0. Next, do we have any community input on the, on closed session items? No? Okay. All right. And we will move to closed session. The items are A, student discipline, one case. B, student grade challenge, one case. C, conference with labor negotiator, public employee dis discipline, dismissal, release, employment. And we will return to open session at 6 p.m. Thank you. Good evening. It is 6 o'clock. And we are starting our meeting for November 14th, 2023. And first we will have our opening ceremonies led by Jose Gomez. Please place your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and next we have our readout from closed session. In closed session, the report out with regard to item 4B, the student grade challenge, the board voted 6-1 to deny the student's grade challenge appeal. And next, we have the adoption of the minutes from October 24, 2023. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Weigand. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Weigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. And before we begin our meeting, um, I just wanted to read something for those who are here and who may not have been to our meeting um, in the past. I wanted to make sure that you are aware on your chair, everyone has a board meeting protocol. And on the back, we also have our civility policy, 1313. So please take a moment to read that and review that if you have a chance. And then I also just wanted to read a statement which um, we are thankful for our public information officer, Annette Franco, who put this together. And some of you may have read it, but I wanted to read it into our board meeting record. Um, in relation to um, an incident that, that happened recently, I wanted to give some background. We do not discipline students for solely ex exercising their right to free speech. Information on social media and news media is inaccurate and incomplete. Since we must comply with and protect student privacy rights, important parts of the issue remain unknown to the public and may cause confusion. It is because of our unwavering commitment to student safety, we can only share limited details. We deeply support and value students' rights to free speech and encourage respectful and thoughtful dialogue about challenging and difficult subjects, but we will not tolerate speech that is hateful, hostile, or that disrupts a safe and supportive learning environment for our students. A safe school environment is a collective commitment in communities that value each other and cultivate diversity. Students may exercise their free speech rights so long as their speech, expression, or conduct is not obscene, lewd, libelous, slanderous, does not incite students to destroy property or inflict injury upon another person, or does not cause substantial disruption to the operations of the school. Ed Code 48907. We have an obligation to maintain a safe learning environment 
while respecting students' rights to speak on issues. We take our obligations very seriously. And because of this, there is an expectation for students to engage in respectful dialogue for change, not hateful speech that could be directed towards a specific student population. Please know that there is more to this issue and we cannot share due to student privacy rights. And if you are here to make a public comment on this, please make sure to stay for the portion of our meeting that includes the superintendent's comments because he will also be addressing it. Thank you. Okay, next we have item 10, our student board member reports. Trustee Crane. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this, uh, this topic tonight is the following. How has your school site demonstrated inclusivity and what are ways the district A, can support or, or and B, provide resources to support inclusivity? And also, as usual, please share two of your campus highlights. Tonight, we have represented uh, from Estancia High School, Jose Gomez, who is uh, on the dais. Then we have Valeria Orozco from Back Bay High School and Brianna Garcia from Newport Harbor. And we will begin with uh, Jose's report. Uh, hello, my name is Jose Gomez. I come from uh, Estancia High School. And one of the uh, ways we have inclusivity in our campus at least is for one of our most underrepresented yet most important populations of students is our LGBTQ students, LGBTQ+, plus, whatever you prefer to call them. Uh, we have something called the Be Yourself Club, which is a safe space for LGBTQ students and uh, allied students to have a space to be safe together. And one way that this district could help out with that and support these underrepresented students could be perhaps partnering with organizations that help LGBTQ students, such as a very uh, well-known example, the Trevor Project. Uh, some of the best people in my life and some of the best people on campus are LGBTQ students. If we are not supporting them and protecting them, just as we would any other students, then we as a district uh, cannot say that we care about students. Uh, on a different note, two campus highlights would have to be the Battle of the Bell game, which Estancia won. Very, very cool. Yeah, I was there. It was heated, but it was great. Great. And another highlight would also be Let's Be Kind Day. It's always a highlight on every single campus here. Uh, specifically in our campus, uh, there, was a lot of, there was lots of food, plenty of people taking photos. Uh, it was just a great day all around, you know. And it really represented the spirit of Let's Be Kind Day. Thank you, Jose. Next, we have Brianna Garcia from Newport Harbor High School. Hello and good evening, Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, and esteemed board members. Inclusivity is a top priority at Newport Harbor as it holds a population of over 2,000 students and staff combined. Harbor is always striving to make the campus home to every corner of the groups at school. One way we achieve this is through meetings known as the Inclusion Council. The Inclusion Council is a group that works to make Newport Harbor a safer and more welcoming environment for all students. They meet several times throughout the year during Late Start Monday mornings to discuss a variety of topics on how, camp on, oops, sorry, on how to make students feel included on campus. These meetings are open to all students and staff who would like to attend and voice their opinions. Along with this, inclusivity is also created on campus through acts of kindness. Kindness is extremely important at Harbor, and this week we are holding our Kindness Week which helps spread inclusive, inclusivity and is also one of our campus highlights. On Monday morning, when students came to school, they were greeted with two poster walls. One of them had the saying, Be Kind, and each student's name was written on a yellow hexagon-shaped paper to represent that everyone has a spot on campus, and as a whole, we all fit together like a beehive. As students walk past the wall, they often search for their name and feel included to be happy in such a positive and big thing. But the most important way of creating an inclusive feeling at Newport Harbor is from the mindset of its students and staff. Many teachers on campus are known for having an open classroom where students can come in during lunch or break if they ever feel overwhelmed or are facing a challenge. 
The best example of our inclusive mindset is our very own principal, Dr. Bolton. If you have ever been on campus while Dr. Bolton talks on the loudspeaker, then you may be familiar with his famous phrase, Diversity is our strength, I love you all, vamos marineros, and as always, go sailors. <laughs> this short and simple saying makes everyone laugh and at the same time feel included. Furthermore, the district's support of inclusivity is extremely important. And a way that the district can provide resources is by sending out surveys to secondary schools about how students are feeling on campus. These surveys, surveys can contain questions about ways students can get involved on campus or how their group or culture is being recognized throughout the school. And lastly, Newport's second campus highlight is the canned food drive and, oh, canned food drive and blood drive that happened last Tuesday. Both of these, both of these events will help people in need, whether they, that might be a blood transfusion or a free meal. Harbor continues to strive to be inclusive to all and create events that benefit the community. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Next, we have Valeria Orozco from Back Bay High School. Come on up. Hello. Um, at Back Bay High School, we pride ourselves on creating an environment where all students feel comfortable and included, especially since all students are coming from different campuses. We have various safest places on campus, including Patrick's Purpose Foundation, Buddy Bench, wellness, access to counselors and social workers at all times. Teachers are available at break and lunch when we need to go to a safe space. Students aren't judgmental to other students with unique preferences in their dressing <coughs> and gender. We have events on campus where other groups socialize and get to meet each other, such as fall festival, field trips to museums, Award rec recognition assemblies, parents are invited to attend. Feel Good Fridays, Christmas party, Let's Be Kind Day. These events have us work in teams doing social activities to break down barriers. The second campus highlight is our ROP classes. These classes help students prepare for their career and college opportunities. We have a medical core and criminal justice classes. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. All right. As an answer. Okay. And next we have the Harbor Council PTA report, Kirsten Walsh. Good evening, Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, trustees, cabinets, student representatives and guests. My name is Kirsten Walsh and I'm the Harbor Council PTA historian who will be reporting tonight for the council. Our president, Cynthia Strassman, sends her regards and wishes you all a very happy Thanksgiving. Reflections update. We received over 100 reflect, reflection art entries last week from our participating schools to be considered at the Harbor Council level. We have 18 schools participating. Our Council PTA Reflections Reception and Gallery is on Thursday, November 30th from 5.30 to 8 p.m. in the District Sanborn Assembly Room. All are welcome to attend. Membership update. Our goal this year is 6,800 members within our Newport Mesa PTAs. As of October 31st, we currently have 4,673 members. We have three PTAs who won the October challenge, 31 new members, Davis, Mariners, and Newport Harbor. We thank our PTAs for their fabulous job and membership and all they do for their school communities. Love our school day. We were pleased to hear about the incredible community support our schools received during the Love Our School Day. We are grateful for the district and its community par partnership for making this pro program a success. Last, Harbor Council PTA thanks you for your supporting, for supporting our PTAs and our council. We are grateful for our partnership and for all those in our community who make it truly special. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. And next we have our CSEA Interim President, Amy Chang, to come and give comments, please. Hey, good evening, President Anderson, board members, Superintendent Smith, cabinet, and guests. I'm Amy Ching, CSEA Chapter President, and I want to speak tonight about supporting students. The working condition, the conditions we work in are the students' learning environments. Classified staff show up every day 
and helps to create a stable environment where students can thrive. Bus drivers, information technology technicians, instructional aides, nutrition services, office staff, maintenance, maintenance techs, and the rest of our members. The conditions we work in are the students' learning environments. As you know, where there's, there were some disruptions recently at California and Pomona Elementary where students were evacuated to other sites. Thankfully, the threats were unsubstantiated. Classified staff was there to support students, many staying after their normal work hours and missing their second jobs to ensure student safety. The conditions we work in are the students' learning environments. Earlier this year, there were some uh, student altercations at a secondary school, and although we would all prefer they not occur, all altercations happen from time to time. During this, an email was sent out to the staff at the site, but the language was directed to certificated staff. Classified staff are also present when altercations occur, and sometimes may be the only adults around. Classified staff should receive equal training to secure the safety of all students. Mm. The conditions we work in are the students' learning environments. Classified staff are one part of a larger community that creates a stable, safe learning environment for all students. We ask that the board and the administration focus on direct and impactful training for all classified <coughs> staff so that we can continue to support and help students reach their full potential. The conditions we work in are the students' learning environments. I want to end tonight with a spirit of thankfulness as we end, enter the holiday season. Be kind to those around you. Be the reason that someone smiles. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have our NMFT president, Rhonda Reed. Good evening, Pre President Anderson, trustees, cabinet, and guests here tonight. I want to thank Dr. Smith and trustees, Carol Crane and Michelle Murphy, and Leona Olson and Megan Brown for um, attending the 2024 Orange County Teachers of the Year Awards Dinner. Our semifinalists, Christine Tipton and Amy Lewis, their mother daughters, um, or daughter rather, um, felt very valued and supported by district management in joining um, in the celebration of a, a very well-deserved honor. This afternoon, I had the privilege of joining M NMFT's Retired Teachers Chapter Meeting. We are so proud of our Retired Teachers Union who enthusiastically support current teachers and are active in helping to pass legislation that protects the hard-earned pensions of retirees. I wanted to mention in our state, there are only 11 CFT retired chapters. We are, feel so fortunate and thankful that NMFT Retired is one. They regularly attend our monthly site rep meetings, come to board meetings, so Cynthia and Joanna yes. are right over there, and Claire. they assist us with the Teacher of the Year um, application um, process. I could go on and on how they do um, and all that they do to support us. I want to public thank them and acknowledge them for their, these um, retirees are energetic, energetic um, feisty, brilliant, <laughs> and good-looking retired <laughs> chapter. Uh, Wes knows this. He was at the meeting this afternoon, too. So thank you. I don't know. Okay. Next, we have community input on non-agendized items. And before we begin, um, if you've been here before or not, I just wanted to clarify that we are here during this portion to listen, so we are not able to respond to you. So if it, if it looks like we're just looking at you, that's because that's the portion where we're just here to listen. Um, and I just wanted to also reiterate, I said this at the beginning, but we have a lot of new folks now. Everybody has a piece of paper on their seat that have our board meeting protocols and our civility policy. So if you would like to review that, that would be excellent. And if um, you would like to make a comment, you may do so at this time. Okay, we will start with Alyssa Ochoa.
Good evening. Thank you, Superintendent Smith, members of the board, the cabinet, um, for this opportunity to speak about Prop 28. My name is Lisa Ochoa. I'm a community leader from Arts Now, Create California. I'm also an arts commissioner for the city of Costa Mesa and a parent in Newport Mesa. Um, as a young student, the arts program at my public school gave me a safe place to fail. My confidence grew in proportion to practice and soon I was thriving in other academic areas. The arts gave me a new voice to express myself, tools for creative problem solving, and a sense of belonging. Uh, and it made a huge life impact. And I want these transformative experiences available to every Newport Mesa student. The good news is we have funding to support this come February, thanks to Prop 28. And more good news, our district has dedicated art, arts educators and leaders, including our excellent Tosa Ms. Fairbanks. Um, and while the Newport Mesa Arts Commission is updating the strategic arts plan to reflect Prop 28 with intent and purpose, now is the moment for our district to take proactive measures to prepare for these funds. Uh, the districts such as Garden Grove, Anaheim, and Santa Ana have already elevated their arts leadership team. And I believe Newport Mesa can also be a superstar and do this too. The first step in the right direction is to appoint a VAPA coordinator on the district level. In addition to two specialists, one for the visual arts and another for music and performance arts. These actionable items will help support our students with meaningful, equitable implementation of Prop 28 funds. Myself and other parents would love to see this topic agendized in future meetings for area input. Art is an extra. It's core curricular required by California Ed Code. And with the spirit of gratitude, I just would like to thank you all and um, thank all of the community engagement you're receiving tonight. Um, it's really inspiring, and I'm completely awestruck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. And next we will have Cynthia Blackwell. Good evening, Dr. Smith and members of the board. Uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you to all of you. <laughs> Wonderful job. I'm only hearing things that are very positive for my colleagues who are still in the classroom, not enjoying retirement like I am. And I'd um, also, also like to, like Rhonda said, thank Dr. Smith for coming to our meeting today. Uh, the retired teachers have been through a lot of superintendents during their 10 years, and literally everybody after the meeting was going, we wish we were working for him. You know, so thank you. But I really wanted to ask, um, not ask, but just bring to the forefront the whole situation with electric bikes. And I'm out driving around a lot, and I see a lot of kids on electric bikes without helmets on uh, to and from school. I know that one of our neighboring cities is supposedly having a program at their high schools. The police department has a training, and if they haven't gone to the training, they can't ride their electric bike to school. I didn't um, and, and verify that, but it came from a reliable source, my sister. And so um, if there's something you guys can work with in regards to the police departments, uh, Newport Beach and Costa Mesa, to have something in place, because the kids, I mean, I, I'm sure you see it too, the helmets on the handlebar, not a handy spot, I used to have bike duty after school, and you'd have to stop the kids over and over, where's your helmet? It's in my backpack. We'll get it on your head, because you can't leave the parking lot until you do. And uh, my last year of teaching at Kaiser, we did have a bike rodeo that was put on by either AAA or the police department. We used to have them at California School all the time. And that would be something that could be brought back and maybe have a parent training, because the parents don't understand, apparently, the rules of... If you're on an electric something, you have to have the helmet on. So just want to just kind of put it out there. It's like a health and safety thing. And um, you guys are so proactive on everything. Most of your parents are probably arguing with your children that went on an electric bike. So just uh, just wanted to say, please uh, do something about that. Because you don't want to have somebody ran over. Uh, my dad, before he got married, did run over somebody on, in his car. And the person was critically injured, the child was, and he never, ever forgot it. His entire life, he brought that up to us. It was a memory to him. So I would hate to have anybody in this room fall victim to being the person that hit somebody and caused injury. So thank you for your time and all your great work. 
Thank you. Um, next, we have um, the, a topic of conversation, and we have seven comments. And so I wanted to see if it was OK if we continue with three minutes, since that's only 21 minutes. OK? Yep. All right, Sounds rather than changing it to two. All right, um, we will start with uh, Jody Eastwick. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to, well, I had a couple of comments. Um, first of all, um, I'm a member of the Newport Coast Elementary School Foundation, and I just wanted to thank you all for helping us fix our hillside, which um, is 95% complete with the remaining 5% coming hopefully next week. Um, so I just wanted to give a big thank you to you guys for all of your help and the district's help in getting that problem solved for our school. Um, secondly, and I didn't really have a chance to kind of formally kind of compose myself, but just uh, about the events that were kind of have come up recently at CDM, um, I just kind of wanted to give a parent's perspective um, on everything that's kind of happened, I was a parent that actually kept their daughter home from school on Monday because I just wasn't sure and I wanted peace of mind and I didn't want to have to worry. So, um, but I have a lot of faith in our administration and I just wanted to let you guys know that I feel like our staff at CDM, I'm a new parent to CDM, but it's been a very welcoming experience and I've been able to interact a lot with our administration and I feel like they're a very generous, very reasonable administration, and I feel like they have really been dragged through the mud as of recent. And I just hope that while I know things got out that were very divisive and um, political and um, a topic that we all kind of are dealing with in our lives right now, but I just think that there's probably more to the story. Um, and I'd like to see maybe the district do something about helping with maybe this is just a suggestion on my part but maybe like some PR um, hiring consultant to kind of help mitigate that for the district and our staff at our school um, but also maybe think of ways um, that are inclusive to kind of address both sides of kind of this politicalized politicized um, topic that's kind of come about uh, maybe even a different way of sending home a letter to families that do have suspensions with as a result of you know these type of actions um, I can say um, I know the boy in question that it was in reference to and have had um, instances where he has not been very kind to one of my daughter's best friends so um, you know there is I see some history in that which people in the news don't really know that so um, I just have faith that our district, our, our principal did what he could probably before taking those actions and I just would hope that we kind of give maybe our administration more tools to be able to address situations like this and kind of come together and solve the problem in a different way. So that's all. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Hassan Murad. Thank you. I also wanted to address this um, this incident. Uh, first of all, I don't think it's a it's appropriate for somebody to talk about their personal experience with that young person if we're going to say that we need to protect minors and not go into details about the situation, which I think is fair. Uh, and I also want to understand what really happened. For me, it's troubling to hear that a boy made such a simple statement as "Free Palestine," and this is deemed a threatening uh, a statement. If that's not the case, okay, you know. Nobody should be, um, uh, you know, put to a different standard or whatever. But um, I also want to know what happened with the principal. He's not a minor. Did he make statements that the, the boy's family uh, claimed that he made, like saying, do you know when Israel uh, became a state? Do you know what happened in 1948? Did, did, is it true that the boy was called a terrorist in school before and said that his country is no longer going to exist and it's being bombed and it's going to go away? This is important. These are important things. And, you know, as a community member, I think it's important that no matter where anybody stands on this issue, we have to ensure that the people that are in charge of making sure that the school environment is safe and 
the student doesn't feel like the principal is on one side or the other or he's bullying the student by making direct statements to him about you know, his position on this issue is very important. So I hope that we can see this in a sober uh, way and understand that the principal should be held accountable for things that he supposedly had said and I want to know if he has said those things. And um, I was initially just outraged and I think I share that same opinion with a lot of people in my community or just people in general that how can a boy, the official statement says he was uh, disciplined for saying free Palestine and this was deemed threatening and that's all he received. The principal wouldn't even meet with the boy's parents. So just on the face of it, this is very, uh, a very sensitive topic and I'm outraged by it and I hope we can get some more clarification with the comments that are supposed to uh, come later in the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Reina uh, Cotter. Good evening, everyone. Again, on the same topic, I just want to uh, make it quick, commend the, uh, the way that the board and the president is handling this issue. And we just need to make sure that we continue to work to make everyone feel safe on the school campuses. And one way to do that is to have our definitions clear and, and right. So we need to define what qualifies as hate speech and what doesn't. Palestine does not by any means, by any standards. And again, like the uh, previous speaker, we just need to know more about what happened and carry, like, um, uh, hold everyone to the same standards. And uh, hopefully that we're all here to, uh, as, a, as an educational setting, to continue to encourage the students to use their w words in a respectful manner. And um, have, we, can, we can hold spaces for emotions and feelings, but we can't really for, for bullying. And we should, be, we should have like zero tolerance for, for bullying and not institutionalize it through our, um, our officials, like the principal. So uh, if the principal has like crossed the line, he needs to be uh, held account accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is Dana al -Khadi. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, this is my first ever <laughs> school board meeting. I actually don't have children yet, and um, it breaks my heart to be here under these circumstances. I am a newlywed. I moved to Costa Mesa a few months ago because of the school district and where I thought I would send my future children. And I'm also a proud Palestinian, someone who is grieving tremendously at the genocide that I am watching on our television screens every day. We are all grieving. And we send our students to school with the hope that when they go to school, they will be in the safe arms of educators. I can remember the name of every single teacher I have ever had because of the transformative impact that they have had on me. I also remember being a Middle Eastern student during 9-11 and being a victim to bullying and taunting by my schoolmates. But what I remember most is my teachers standing up for me and making me feel like my school was a safe place for me to learn and for me to grow. I am not only disappointed, I am really troubled by the fact that a Palestinian student can be bullied and taunted for the genocide happening in his place of origin and then be the one disciplined. In the introductory comments, we heard that we do not know the whole story, but the student disciplinary paperwork says, and I quote, student name said threatening remarks to a young lady. He said free Palestine. At best, this represents sloppy paperwork on the part of our teachers, something that is unacceptable in its own right, particularly around sensitive topics, and I ask us all to work to amend this for future incidents. But at worst, this does represent utter violation of the student and their right to express themselves. And the fact remains that only one student was initially disciplined. The phrase free Palestine is not a threat. It is not something that we punish people for saying. It is something we should be proud of our students for, for representing critical thought on global events and forming their own opinions, and for being proud of the diversity that they bring to their school. It is not enough to unsuspend a student. I ask that free speech continue to be upheld, that the teachers involved in this incident undergo sensitivity training to ensure that events like this do not happen again, and that we honor your zero tolerance policy for bullying, no matter if the person being bullied is someone who represents or mirrors our political thought. I want to thank you for your time and um, to the students in the school district who feel minimized by this incident,
For the families who now fear for their children and the environment in which they are being educated, I want to reiterate Free Palestine. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Next, we have Kelly Kohani. Hi, my name is Kelly Kohane. Um, I'm a community member. I actually grew up uh, nearby in the Huntington Beach Union High School District. Um, and uh, recently, um, with uh, this issue with the Free Palestine, it really just made me concerned. Um, as to, I, I completely agree with what the last uh, four people said, but also for the future. What are we setting precedent on? Um, and really, what message are we giving? Uh, and I totally understand we can't get all of the information, but for future, you know, uh, this is not going to be the last time something like this happens. So how are we going to deal with it in a way that respects everyone's opinions, um, in a way that's safe for everyone, in a way where free speech is, uh, uh, able to be said in a safe, uh, nurturing environment, and uh, where there's no uh, disproportionate uh, outcomes for for words that we say, um, and maybe uh, being able to teach people how to express it in a way that uh, is not threatening or violent. Of course, we want to ensure everyone's safety, but that everyone can be heard and can express uh, they need to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Phil DiNapoli. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Um, I am a, a new parent at CDM. Just have a brief statement. Securing the uh, safety and wellness of our children must be the highest priority of the school board. No child should feel threatened or scared at school. Bullying should never be allowed. Principal Haley should be commended for doing his job. The school board should be acknowledged for supporting their administrators. Threats, bullying, and studying violence are not free speech and must not be tolerated. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Rebecca Salahani. Good evening, my name is Rebecca Salahani and I have two kids in the Newport Mesa district who have been in the um, school district since pre-kindergarten and I hope to keep my kids in until college and I take very great pride in the whole district and in CDM High School as well as, well as Newport Coast Elementary School. I'd like to make some comments about the administration at CDM High School as well as efforts on inclusion, positive communication, and um, a few other sentiments. The administration at CDM, in my experience, in the past um, last year and this year, has been uh, unbelievably helpful for the um, development of my child, both behaviorally, educationally, extracurricularly, and as a member and citizen of our community. The mentors that are both, uh, that are teachers, <coughs> coaches, administrators, and combinations thereof have given my son the utmost experience that I could imagine in any public or private school or any school. It's my responsibility to raise my child with good standards, but I do also receive support from the school to help me to, with his um, development. Uh, namely, um, Principal Jake Haley in combination with Assistant Principal Perry as well as other uh, mentors on campus such as GW Mix have all um, set the utmost example for my child and they have built personal connections with him. They have encouraged him to um, play football, lacrosse, be extracurricular and I'm aware uh, that Jake Haley has over 26 years um, in education experience. He's a doctor with a doctorate in education. Over half of his um, career in education has been as a principal. To me, I find him overqualified for his position, and it's very important for me to foster a um, environment where he is safe, protected, able to do his job, and has the proper morale to have the motivation to stay in his position until my son graduates and until my daughter graduates. 
So um, I'd also like to make some comments about inclusivity, which Principal Haley, uh, I believe, has also invested a lot of time into creating more inclusivity on campus, both now and in the future, in terms of curriculum uh, development around ethnic inclusion and diversity, also e economic diversity. I know cases where he has personally reached out to help people that are impoverished and homeless to help them obtain housing in the community, and he has volunteered his time for sports. Lastly, it's very important to me, I'm very hopeful that the, all parties can reach a, a resolution in a way, find ways to resolve any misunderstandings. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next is Sarah Pillen. Hello, board members, Dr. Smith, families, and students. I'm Sarah Pylon, the director for the Culinary Arts Pathway in Newport Harbor. First off, thank you all for your support for our CTA, uh, CTE Culinary Pathway. I know that you believe in our program, have seen the good that we do, the good that comes out of it, and even enjoyed the food that we've served to you. I'm here today to speak about the immediate and critical need to remodel our kitchen laboratory and the scope of the project. Our program has grown tremendously since I inherited it about 12 years ago. When I started in this district, I was the only teacher with six sections, about 150 students and an incomplete pathway. Since then, we have increased our staff, doubled our classes and competition teams, made it a four-year pathway, doubled our graduates and numbers to nearly 300 students each year, aligned our pathway to industry needs and have many industry mentors, created the Shipyard Cafe, and signed articulation agreements with our local community colleges. Culinary is a marquee program at Harbor. We are the number one CTE elective for our special populations. Students, many sites and subjects struggle to reach, but who we find exceptional. We are nationally recognized, earning many honors and awards. We reign superior over other districts' culinary programs, yet we have an outdated 1960s home at kitchen, which you all know. Our building is an embarrassment. Because we have two teachers teaching at the same time, in a space designed for only half the 70 students we serve given at any given time, we are forced to share space or rotate in and out, diminishing the educational experience. We are bursting at the seams beyond the sad state of our facility. <coughs> On numerous occasions, the fire and health departments have halted our operations and our catering. Just this month, about eight events we had to cancel, and we have just put a Band-Aid over these problems over the years. Here's my plea. Please give us the money for the project that the architects have proposed for a modern learning kitchen. Please do not cut down on the proposed plans and give us just a scaled down kitchen. These award winning kids deserve a kitchen that is comparable to their peers in our other districts where they've gotten new kitchens twice, three times over since I've been a culinary teacher. These award, um, let's see, we cater, we compete, we lead, we certify, we serve the underserved, we serve the district, and we teach. Our scope is, and reach is wide, requiring the need to, uh, for both a residential kitchen and a commercial kitchen. Residential to fit the needs of our introductory student, and commercial to fit the needs of the advanced students whose curriculum builds over their four years. Please give us a concession area and a collective space so we can continue to serve our community. Please start the construction now. We've patiently endured challenges while others have made the improvement. Our students deserve the best. Please do not push the kitchen project to the back burner. Please see the need to start it now and fully phone the construction project that architects have designed specifically to fit our needs. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next is Amanda um, Latcher, I believe. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your consideration. I'm speaking also on behalf of Newport Harbor High School for an updated culinary kitchen. I'm here to urge you for a new kitchen, catering space, and all additional requirements that's needed at Newport Harbor High School. Sacrificing this budget or project will be sacrificing the education that our students are given. I mean, you can qualify to talk about this because I myself am an alumni at Newport Harbor High School and I was in the culinary pathway for all four years of high school. I competed in state and national culinary competitions and I brought recognition to the program and to the amazing educators that we have. I currently mentor the program in terms of the business programs and even in the arts activities that we provide, as well as um, for the culinary competitions as well. So I've seen the kitchen evolve over the past eight years since I've been in high school, um, and it is still basically putting a Band-Aid over a broken leg. It's just not <coughs> fixing the problem. 
After high school, I went to that time Cornell University where I studied hospitality at an Ivy League institution majoring in business and hospitality. Um, and since then, I've also opened my own restaurant in Orange County in Laguna Hills that serves fresh American comfort food designed for takeout. We employ a lot of high school students at our, at our restaurant from Laguna Hills High School, which also has a culinary program. So I see the needs of culinary students who want jobs from me. And I really employ those who have culinary skills, who know how to operate commercial equipment for their own safety and also for ease of training them on my own behalf, and as well as making sure that they truly get the acumen they need to succeed. Having an updated culinary kitchen will truly make sure that every student has the ability to learn the best that they can at our program, whether they want to go into culinary or not. Some of them may not go to college after graduation, and having an updated kitchen where they actually know how to operate commercial equipment is key. There's different heat levels, different operating procedures, different safety and sanitation standards, and all this can be learned um, through a catering kitchen and through a professional kitchen that I really hope that Newport Harbor High School can get. I've toured many other high school kitchens at OSHA, at schools, public and private schools up in Los Angeles, um, who also will be competing at the culinary competitions. And they have amazingly beautiful kitchens that have so many more capabilities than Newport Harbor High School does and the 1960s home ec kitchen that I learned in when I was a student. Even though I was able to attend an Ivy League institution, I know that um, being able to have worked in a kitchen in high school that truly matches those of counterparts of other high schools or that could also match those at actual restaurants that these hope students will hopefully get internships in um, would truly make a difference in everyone's education. Our two professors, Pilon and Kingsbury, have been instrumental in teaching students the skills that they need in such a limited building, and I truly hope that in the future that we'll be able to update this so that they can truly um, learn as much as they can at their time here at Newport Harbor High School. It's really going to impact their futures, and the work that all of our educators do and all that you guys do to provide for our district is amazing, and I truly hope that we can continue to evolve this program that has been evolving over the past 12 years with Chef Pylon and will continue to evolve in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is Ashley Kingsbury. Good evening, Dr. Smith and board members. My name is Ashley Kingsbury, and I'm a Coastline ROP instructor, and this is my seventh year of teaching at Newport Harbor. I love Newport Harbor, and I'm so thankful that I get to teach there at such an incredible school. In the past seven years, I've gone from teaching one class every other day to having a full load of six classes. Over that time, we have developed a program and a culture that allows kids who do not feel like they have a place to be themselves a place to actually call their own. They find that there is a future for them when they didn't even know before they took our classes. I came to my role as a chef instructor with almost 20 years of hospitality industry experience. Throughout my professional career, I had the opportunity to work in some of Orange County's premier restaurants and bakeries. I have seen firsthand what the industry standard is for an efficient and functional kitchen space. What we have at Harbor is not up to that standard. We have almost 300 kids coming into our classes and the space that we have, is, uh, that we have to use is not adequate. I want our students to be ready for industry when they graduate from our program, but many aspects of our kitchen do not help facilitate that. Sarah Pylon and I spend much of our time navigating facility deficiencies and game planning solutions to all the problems that our current kitchen has pre presented us. Just a few of these challenges include persistent plumbing issues resulting in sewage backup, insufficient ventilation culminating with a violation notice from the fire department, and faulty equipment. In addition, due to the limited size and furnishing of our space, we have missed out on <coughs> countless events and catering opportunities simply because we lack the capacity and resources to ensure success. We have been resourceful and effective for the most part, but time loss has impacted our program's progression. Having a commercial kitchen and a residential kitchen is essential for building the gold standard for which we aspire. Using commercial grade equipment in a commercial grade facility will help these kids succeed when they get hired in the food service industry. Thank you. Thank you. And we have um, one additional comment, but as I said last meeting, um, our closed session, our community input items are for things that are not on our agenda yet are within our subject matter jurisdiction. And so this comment is about something that is not in our subject matter jurisdiction. Then so I'm going to change the comment. Then I will change the comment to what you've already discussed. I don't know what that means, sir. And we explained this in detail just, last time. I'll discuss the no, we're moving. We're moving so on. You're not going to allow me to speak. You did not submit a card on that. We're moving on. Thank you're not you. Allowing me to speak. You did not submit exactly. a card. Okay. Okay. Oh, 
Only. Number 14, superintendent's comments. I appreciate the update on Prop 28. Before I get into some of these clarifications, because I know people watch the trustees, and if anyone is thinking they're fidgeting because they don't appreciate what you're saying, that's not it. There's an ant infestation up here. Everyone's <laughs> trying to pay attention. My wife is watching this tonight knowing that I have a bug phobia, <laughs> and it's all I can do right now to not take off my jacket and run around up here crazily. Um, so no disrespect intended. Um, Prop 28 is very important to the district. In fact, I've seen very few districts in my career that have supported the arts like this district does. Tamara Fairbanks helps lead a lot of that effort. Um, we're really excited about Prop 28. In fact, uh, this district, because we haven't received any state money, self-funded the 20% of the revenue that can be used for other things other than personnel. Tonight, capital advisors will be giving a legislative update. They, I suspect, will be talking about how they're trying to help us with some of the language that makes it hard for us to supplement and not supplant. Um, so, so thank you for raising that issue. It really is important. And as you said, it's not uh, in addition to its core to what we do here. Uh, with regard to bike safety, we do in fact have a relationship in Newport Beach PD with a certification program like you described. And we're working with Costa Mesa on a similar program right now. So the things that were brought up, just want to let the community know we take bike safety very seriously. I rode a motor, or I rode, I ride uh, a motorcycle. Um, I wear a helmet appropriate for that that's not approved. Um, our e-bikes these days go as fast as a motorcycle. Uh, they're dangerous and they should be treated as such. So we're absolutely on board with that. With regard to the culinary, uh, the program is better even than they described it, and they described it very favorably. Um, and, and we're excited to see what uh, that kitchen looks like when it's done and the opportunities it will provide. I do think uh, the folks missed an opportunity to really sway the board. They could have brought samples. <laughs> I've, I've tasted their food, and uh, their food is it's next level. It's next level, although that wouldn't have helped with the ants. Um, I want to I be really, really serious, though, uh, in, in my response or clarifications around the other topic. It's, first, let me say um, uh, I want to commend and thank our community members for the respectful way that they passionately described their concerns. Um, I also want to say that I would never disrespect people by appropriating their outrage. I do not know how outraged you are. I've been doing this for a long time, though, and what I understand is that people do get upset, and I understand why, because they don't get all of the story. Uh, they read the media, and at best, that's half right, um, because we're not able to comment, not able to share what's happening, and, and it's further frustrating for people. And again, I'm not pretending to know how frustrating it is, but I know that it is because you don't get to hear about personnel matters. We can't talk about what we're doing with people that work for us. And we can't talk about students and how we're handling their discipline. We can only talk in generalities and hope that people understand and trust that we are doing our jobs. Um, we, we very much support free speech in this country uh, and in our schools. We think it's a cornerstone of our democracy and something that has to be protected. Um, that is something we are committed to continuing. We want to make sure that people understand that this district does not consider Free Palestine hate speech. Once again, we do not consider Free Palestine hate speech. And again, I can't compliment or comment on what's happening in these instances, but what I can say in general is when we look at language used in this district, language relative to discipline. We look at uh, to whom the language is targeted or addressed, the pervasiveness of the use of that language. Is it intended to harm a student? Uh, and does it disrupt the learning environment? And that's how we evaluate language uh, as it's relative to discipline. I, I think it's important to clarify that the district has made no official statement about this discipline, only uh, about the story 
and what we, um, what we honor and value. Uh, the parts that were referenced by our community member were uh, published by uh, a citizen, uh, not the district. So just to be clear, we haven't commented on it. We haven't said it's only one student. Um, so that suggestion that it's only one student is, is not the district's <coughs> statement, to be clear. We, we totally um, believe that we have to look into matters even that uh, apply to our staff, right? That we have a huge obligation leading schools, teaching kids, uh, and any suggestion that we can do better in that regard, we take that seriously. We just can't tell you what we're doing. Uh, and I know that can be frustrating. I don't pretend to know how frustrating it is. Uh, I think moving forward, there was a comment made about how do we, how do we get better how do we heal and move forward? We've had lots of great suggestions, hearing from multiple voices about restorative practices, uh, bringing students together and in healing together, uh, involving groups like Groundswell and others to help in that regard. Uh, someone mentioned a consultant. We're, we're all in, and not just at one school, throughout this entire district to make sure that all 32 school sites are inclusive and accessible and safe for every single kid. And so that's, that's our commitment. Uh, again, we do not consider Free Palestine hate speech. Uh, we absolutely are committed to free speech, and we're committed to making sure that every single square inch of this district is safe for our students. And that's what we're about. So, thank you. Thank you. And we do not have any community input on agenda items. Is that correct? OK. Next, we will move on to item 16, achievement. And we will have Ms. Shields, our report on attendance, please. Thank you. We have a couple members of our team that will come up and share and frame this conversation. It's going to be a good one. Story of my life. All those students were here just for that, too. Thank you. I might run out. So we, the board has asked that every month we prioritize achievement and talk about how students are doing with an honest lens and I'm really framing our improvement and our efforts and our focus. And we thought it really important to bring to you where we are in attendance. Last year, we did get feedback from the state that attendance was an issue for the district. We know post pandemic that just a lot of things has happened. A lot of things changed in terms of what we consider attendance and, and those priorities. And so we spent a lot of time as a leadership team diving into data, having conversations, reaching out to families. And we want to share with you how we think we've done in a year, where we think we're going, and the things we're working on because students being in schools matter to us. And we know that's how the best education is delivered. So Vanessa will start us off. Thank you, Ms. Gailey. Okay, good evening, everyone. President Anderson, Superintendent Smith, members of the board, esteemed guests, thank you for staying. Um, we want to talk about attendance this evening and, and show you kind of where we've been and where we're going. Um, last year was the restart to our accountability system in California. And so I am um, kind of the face of accountability in our district, but we like to say that it's compliance with a smile in Newport Mesa. Um, and so we want to focus on attendance this evening and, uh, and how it relates to accountability, but also how it's important for us to children to be present and engaged. And so one of the things that we have to establish from the beginning are definitions. What does it mean to be absent? And uh, what does it mean to be truant? Because they're not the same. 
truant students don't have an excuse to be absent, but there are many reasons why students are absent. As you can see up here, excused absences, unexcused absences, out of school suspensions, and then independent study where students don't complete the work and therefore we don't get the credit for them attending. All of those are considered an absence. An accumulated absence leads to chronic absenteeism. And so the definition of chronic absenteeism is when students are absent for 10 or more, 10 percent or more of the instructional days students were expected to attend. And so we have some examples of chronic absenteeism because of course the school year isn't over and the story hasn't been completely written. But the, throughout the year we're looking at the story and we're taking a pulse. If you were in school for 50 days and you've been absent for five of them, then right now you're considered chronically absent. And if a student is enrolled for 90 days and absent for nine, then they're considered chronically <coughs> absent. Whether they were excused, whether they were suspended, whether it was unexcused, really the reason doesn't matter. And so that's what's important for us to look at. It's not about blame, it's about understanding the accumulation of absences and how that can impact students. So this timeline is a focus on attendance and notice it does start with compliance because last year in February, um, after the restart of accountability, we were notified that some of our schools were um, identified for additional targeted support and improvement. Um, and again, as they were restarting accountability, not all of the metrics were in place. And so 23 of our schools had this status and um, most of it was for chronic absenteeism. And so we began with an attendance campaign and some school planning to address it. I also happen to be in charge of the school plan, so this is near and dear to my heart and embedded in the school plans is a place for us to address um, why schools are in ATSI. And then also, as the school year launched, we had some pieces that we started to put in place. A secondary alternative to suspension so that we could still have kids learn and address ideas and then capture that attendance, as well as a relaunched attendance mm -hmm. campaign. We've uh, contracted with a, a company for attention to attendance and launched a platform to automate a letter writing campaign to make sure that families understand where they stand um, in terms of uh, attendance. We've also updated our codes in our student information system and made sure everyone is clear about what they mean and then initiated independent study contracts on a short term basis for again for students to be able to recapture some of the learning when they're not present. So I want to show you what the accountability system looks like. Prior to the pandemic, there was this five color coded table and each of the different metrics that are required um, have some cut points. And so in our initial year, if it was a normal year, then you would see that blue is really good and red is not so good. And so usually we want to have um, uh, scores be very high when we're talking about um, ELA and math uh, assessments, but for chronic absenteeism, we want it to be low. Okay, so and this is kind of a reverse. And you can see that very high is 20% or more of our student population being chronically absent. And that gets you in the red, whereas blue, very, very low, is 2.5% or less. So this is what a grid looks like. And what this does is it acknowledges a status, so again, that five colors, as well as change. And so if you improve over time, even if it was a very high level of absenteeism, if you're chipping away <coughs> at it and getting better, then districts like us, who could be higher than 20%, like us, could eventually get better because we're taking, chipping away at it over time. So again, status shows you on the left what the cut points are, and change on the right shows you how we can get better over time. So I want you to know that the new dashboard is not out yet. This is a prediction based on data that was published on DataQuest. So the dashboard isn't out and the complete story hasn't been written, but this is the way that we think it's going to, to shake out. Also, you should know that last year, the, the, the rate that says 2021-22, if you go back and look at the CDE dashboard, it's all colors of purple. But purple wouldn't help us do a comparison here, so we color-coded it what it would have been if the, the dashboard was really up to speed last year. And then what we did is looked at the definitions and applied them to this 22-23 chronic absenteeism rate so that we could see did we improve. And what you'll notice is there's not so much red. You'll notice is there's a lot of green, meaning all of those schools decreased their chronic absenteeism. So we really want to highlight that while it's not great, we would love it to be green and blue, we're seeing quite a bit of improvement. And also, our focus on attendance didn't start really until February when we realized the implications on the dashboard and we knew that we really needed to address this systematically. The other thing I will say is there's asterisks next to the high schools. That's because according to the dashboard, they don't count for the colors. 
it's TK through 8 that would be um, penalized for the colors. But what we wanted to do was give an apples to oranges comparison because we think attendance is important TK 12. And for my last piece of this puzzle, um, we wanted to take a dipstick of where are we now as a district. So we looked as of November 1st, where are we with our attendance, whether chronically absent or present. And so the good news is 86% uh, are uh, doing okay. We have some in the at-risk level, but a lot of kids with perfect attendance and satisfactory attendance, we want to celebrate that. But we want to also acknowledge that 14% of our district as of November 1st was either severely or chronically absent. And um, while the good news is it's less than last year's autopsy of 21%, we still have a ways to go. If we maintain this, we would go from red to yellow as a district, whereas right now we predict we would be standing at the orange level. So I don't want to say let's aim for 14%, but maybe we could stay below it. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, George Knights. Thank you. Good evening, board. Uh, I'm here to put this into the context of the county. So we looked at this issue of attendance in, in a lot of different lenses. And um, we tend to compare ourselves to the unified school districts in the county. There's many more school districts than just those that are there on that list to the left. Um, as Vanessa said, we can do better. Here it's, it's lower numbers on top are doing better on the chronic absenteeism ranking through the county, and we are um, remarkably low in that. So it's, it's organized by the 22-23 chronic absenteeism rate. However, if you can see that we have a decent growth, um, and when Vanessa said that we are doing better, we are getting better, and we're getting better every year, um, you can see that we're getting better uh, and rank fourth in terms of, of how we are in terms of improvement. And we're looking to get better every day. We know we can do better. And you'll hear a lot more stories about how we're doing that, even starting last year. This is all of the school districts in the county and ranked by how much better they're getting after, over the years. And it's, it's, it's a little bit. This is absenteeism and especially attendance is a moving target for all the districts in Orange County. It's been very difficult to figure this out. There's a lot of lenses you can look at it. We're having to correct codes in our own systems, retrain staff how to use those codes. And every, everybody in the county is going through the same thing. Colleagues that I have all over the county are saying the very same things. So for a while, it's going to be tough to grow, but we are in the top of the county, at least in terms of growth. So I'll turn it over to um, my colleague, I believe, Sarah. So, of course, we didn't want to end there because data just is. But we want to share what we're doing because we certainly recognize, again, what our superintendent has made it clear that we will excel and be the best in the county, if not the best in the state. So we know we have to give this attention and change the outcomes. And one of the things, so our administrators have been getting together, other job alikes, really thinking like what is happening as we dig deeper into the data. And one of the things we know is that to solve this will be through relationships. That parents actually at home, there are a lot of decisions made about whether children come to school or not, particularly as they're younger. Certainly as they age, there might be more decisions being made independently by the student. But it is about solving this together with families. We also have noticed, looking at the data, that there is a cultural shift. People are staying home because they're ill. That is our largest number of absences are excused illnesses. And so that's an interesting shift just in how we think as a society and how we're going to be, what that'll mean as we seek resolution moving forward. And again, with the chronic absenteeism, it doesn't matter the reason. It's simply that they're not here, and they're not here a significant number of days. So how we solve the different problems, again, it is across all zones these issues are happening. And generally speaking, as we dove into the data, many of the reasons are the same. So right after illness are issues of, uh, as you'll see up here, either school refusal 
or anxiety or mental health concerns or some combination of the above. And again, those issues, we tangentially help those in schools, but those are really issues that families need help solving on their own. There are some things we can do to help, so it really is about those partnerships and moving us forward. And Sarah will share with you all of the things that we're doing to strengthen and inform those partnerships. Great, thank you so much. So I'm excited to share that as we continue to look at and refine our attendance systems and interventions, we have kind of done an overhaul of our attendance handbook. It still is in draft form, so we're not ready to share all of it quite yet, but we're excited to be able to provide some guidance to the sites. Because as George mentioned, there is an update in some of the codes that we've done. We've had a lot of new staff join us, and so we want to make sure that people feel supported along the way and know how to properly code their attendance so that we're getting a really accurate reflection based off of the data about why students are absent. We've added additional codes so we can get a little bit more granular in the details about why students are missing school so that then we can properly um, intervene and provide that support. So you'll see that we have our um, different tiers of intervention and it also is aligned to when we send out our truancy and chronic absenteeism letters. Um, our universal is things that happen at the school every single day just to help students feel engaged and a part of the community. Our early intervention includes things like our SART meetings, so that's a student attendance review team. Um, it'll include site-based home visits, so we have a home visit team that would go from the site. Um, and it also includes other things like mentorships, making sure that there's check-ins, and making sure that we're providing adequate support to the student at the site. We also have our Tier 3 interventions for those students who aren't responding to our Tier 2. They would be um, things such as our student or our pupil reengagement team. So that's our district level um, home visit team that would be deployed out for our students who have our tier three attendance issues. It's also our SARB. So if you're familiar with the Student Attendance Review Board, it's a higher level meeting that includes district personnel as well as community resources that come together to see how we can support students. So there's a variety of things that can be tried. This is no, by no means an exhaustive list, but definitely recommendations for the site on things that they can try, as well as things that we do at the district level for students who are experiencing high levels of absenteeism. So as Vanessa mentioned, we did partner with A2A to start sending out our attendance letters, which we're really excited about this partnership because it is an automated system. The school sites have a lot more control now, too, to be able to look at the letters, review the letters, and they're sent out on a um, regular mm -hmm. basis. So they're able to send out letters for all the students who are um, experiencing high levels of absenteeism as well as truancy, but they also have the ability to suppress the letter. So if we have extenuating circumstances in which we know why the student is missing school, we wouldn't be sending them a letter because we know what's going on and there's been communication back to the site. But we're excited about this because, again, it's just another way for us to notify our families, make sure that they're informed, and gather more data. So we've sent out our first round of letters. We got notification today that we're, gonna, we're just about to send out our second round. Um, so you'll see our first round of chronic letters. We sent 368 letters. Excessive excuse absences, so those are definitely excuse, illness, things like that. We had 513. And then truancy letters, we sent out over 800. So we had a lot of letters go out so that families could be notified. And the threshold for this is that they've missed 10% or more. So if it's a chronic, um, chronic letter, it's 10% or more of chronic absenteeism. Same thing for excuse, same thing for truancy. Um, as I mentioned, part of our tier two intervention is to have our student attendance review team. Um, and it really is showing and demonstrating the power of the village of the school. And so coming together, including the nurse, including the counselor, including the team at the school that's there to support the student and really digging in to see what is going on and what's preventing the student from coming to school. So that if we need to connect them with additional resources or supports, then we can do that. Then again, our tier three is our student or our school attendance review board. Um, we're excited to share that this year we've moved it to the Melinda Hoag Center, um, which is an exciting partnership for us because just this last week we had our first SARB hearings. We had families who came and they were able to get connected to resources on the spot right there in the center, which is a really exciting opportunity for our families. Um, so that's new to us, and so we're excited to continue with that partnership throughout the year. You'll notice here, too, that on the SARB referral, there's a lot more information that's being gathered because, again, we're continuing to look for reasons why students aren't attending school and trying to reduce those barriers. 
Um, so we also want to share, too, some of the proactive work that our amazing school sites are doing. If you want a Popsicle or a donut, it's a great time to go to these schools because you will definitely be provided with them in abundance. But we're excited to be able to celebrate with our students at school so that they can feel excited about the achievement of being able to be at school. It's not always just perfect attendance, but improved attendance and the positive things and being able to recognize these kids for coming to school and trying their best um, and working hard each and every day. And so we're grateful for our schools and being able to celebrate at that lower levels and the leadership of our site leaders. Um, so I also am excited to share just the amazing work that our public information office has been doing as far as promoting positive attendance. And so working in partnership um, to really get the message out to our communities to attend school every day, to start, stay, and finish strong. Um, so you'll notice potentially that there's um, community messages that are going out, so emails that are going out to parents. We've got a social media campaign, um, again, to start the year right. We're talking about attending class every single day. You've got this. Really trying to encourage that positive attendance and get the word out in a variety of different formats. You've hopefully also seen our amazing banners that are out at every school site. We have six-foot banners that are color-coded by the school's colors that have been posted at the schools. Um, so you'll see they're all around the district from every, you know, from the elementary all the way through our secondary. We have Monta Vista up here because, again, we really want to make sure that the message is being spread district-wide, that att attendance matters, that we want students in school every day throughout the entire year. Um, we also are starting our postcard, postcard campaign. These postcards, the first round, will be set out tomorrow. And so these are sent to families where we've started to see that they um, are having more absences. The threshold is 5% versus the 10% for the letters. So our hope is that we're able to catch families a little earlier before the letter has to go out so that they know that we've noticed, how can we help, what kind of support can we provide, so hopefully we can capture them before it starts to become an even bigger issue. Um, in addition to that, we've also looked at different ways that programmatically we can help to support students' attendance. So we did start an alternative to suspension program this year that is housed over at Presidio. This is an opportunity for a student in secondary who has been suspended from school. They can be offered, when appropriate, an alternative to suspension where they go to Presidio, they're able to do their work, but then they're also able to have some connections, some learning opportunities, um, restorative practices, opportunities to reflect. If they participate, then the suspension is actually removed and it's replaced with a positive attendance. So it shows that they went and now they're getting credit for participating in an academic program for the day. We've seen tremendous success. A lot of families are taking us up on this opportunity and we look forward to this continuing to grow. We also have the opportunity for short-term independent study contracts. So if a student is going to be out, we know they're gonna be out for whatever the reason might be, we can offer short-term independent study, again, as a way to capture their attendance. So if they complete the work that they need to, they demonstrate that when they return, and then those absences are then positive attendance. So then they aren't ca counted as absent for those days. Um, you'll also notice if you've been in the district for a while, we um, used to have a Scooby van. It's re been replaced with our Scooby compact car. And so we are really looking forward to having our district pupil reengagement team will be out and about in the community, really looking for our families who are experiencing that tier three of attendance um, issues, whether it be chronic absenteeism or truancy, so that we can try to get those families reengaged. We'll have our coordinator go out. There'll be a social worker, school community facilitator, so really a team that's deployed out, again, to really help families and provide them with the highest levels of support that we can. And then lastly, when our team does go out, if we unfortunately miss the family, instead of having someone just kind of shove a business card in the door or in the screen, um, our public information office has put together these wonderful door hangers that we're able to leave for the family. Again, with more of a positive message, not call me because you're absent. But we stopped by. We're really interested in helping you. Can you please call us back so that we can get, help get your child back into school? And just wanted to share, this has been a leadership focus for us and will continue to be all year long. Principals are really engaged, thinking about ways 
preemptively to bring families back to make sure students feel seen, valued, and heard on campus. We know that we're doing this in partnership with families, and we also know that some other partnerships will also help because we know areas of transportation, mental health, and other things that are barriers for families are things we might be able to help with, if not in the district directly, certainly connect them to the right people. So that's really where we're going. And again, it will be a year-long focus for us as leadership teams to make sure we're making a difference in this. Questions? Excuse me. Thank you. Yes, Trustee Murphy. Oh. Um, sorry, I really do not like the ants. So <laughs> <laughs> I can hand I'd be I'd rather have snakes, honestly. <laughs> um, okay, so um, so two things. So what did you mean by suppressed in that? Sure. So we, the site administrator would have the opportunity basically to skip a letter. And so if a family is due to receive a letter, they can suppress it so that the family wouldn't receive that round of the letter. Why would they suppress it? So we've had circumstances where maybe a parent has passed away. Okay. And so a student is out. So it's really these like higher level or there's a family illness or something where um, we know why the student is coming, isn't coming and it's more of a serious situation and so we just don't wanna to add to that by yep. sending them an attendance letter. Okay, sounds good. And then um, I like the door hangers, very nice. Um, but what about our homeless families or you know, our McKinney-Vento families? So how are they being contacted? Or? Sure, so the team would deploy out to wherever we know their last known address may be. And so it may be at a motel, it may be that they're doubled up or wherever they may be. And so they would go out and make every best effort. They obviously may not be able to leave a door hanger or a card, but we would continue to try to make contact. And it could be that we're doing more outreach, we're reaching out to other contacts. You know, we're not going to stop just because we can't find them the first time. We're going to look for a variety of methods. We could be trying email, maybe that's not working, or again, contacting somebody else who knows the family to see, hey, do you know where they might be staying at this time? So then we can go to them. But our, our purpose is really to go to the families versus trying to make them come to us so that we can get to them, provide them those resources, and continue to check in. And then, um, which I think is great, um, and this is great because I will say I um, <laughs> I had a, a parent contact me who received the generic letter I think that went out to the whole district right signed by Wes he did ask me <laughs> if every parent received it and did we really spend the postage on it um, which <laughs> that was fun yeah. um, <laughs> so um, I told him it would be followed up by email so not to worry and he wanted to know specifically if there was going to be any sort of, you know, other repercussions besides, you know, just letters and notices and all of that. So, mm -hmm. and I'm, we're getting to this, I'm assuming, right, the intervention levels. Correct. And so for students who aren't responding to those tier one interventions, so our positive attendance campaign, we would be looking at navigating through the tiers to provide them higher level intervention. So that tier two is really that site-based intervention. And so the site team, the principal, assistant principal, counselor, um, again, school community facilitator, possibly the social worker are getting involved to help to support the family and so that's the student attendance review team and so they're coming together and then they're putting interventions into place and then monitoring how things are going if we're not seeing an improvement then there are referrals to the district attorney meeting which is really kind of the district attorney coming and sharing you know what does it look like if your child's missing school what are some of the things that could happen if they don't respond then then we're going to the SARP hearing you know Truancy has changed as far as it's still um, highly regarded as, you know, kids need to be in school, but we're not looking at arresting people. We're not looking at giving huge fines like the times of the past. It's really looking at how can we provide this truancy mediation and kind of get in there? How can we provide support? What community partners can come in to help to support the family? Do they maybe need a case manager outside of the district who's helping to support them? And really looking at how we can leverage all of our community partners to come in and to support the family. Does the parent need support because the kid just won't get out of bed in the morning? Or what is it that's really causing the student to not come to school? Getting to that root cause and providing the appropriate support. Great, thanks, sir. Okay, um, next, our student board member, Jose. Uh, yes, um, this is less of a question, more so of a comment. Uh, seeing that they, 
I thought it was done. Go ahead. I apologize. No, it's more than fun. <laughs> please, please go ahead. Yeah, no, no, this is less of a question, more of a comment. But uh, seeing that we're really taking into account the mental health of our students is, it, it really brings a smile to my face and a sort of, you know, good feeling to me. As someone who, you know, with the subject of mental health being so close to home, not only as a student, but also as a student who knows a lot of students who are going through things. It's great to see that no longer, like the days of the past, even as recently as 2019 before the pandemic, um, I don't wanna say all staff, but we were, they were pretty dismissive of mental health. And it's great to see that now we're taking more of a helping approach to it instead of just dismissing it and focusing on trying to get the student to school, but actually helping the student want to come to school again. Uh, it's really great, and I'm really happy to see that change happening. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Trustee Barto. Oh, I did not have my... Um, I, oh, Because oh. they're switched. <laughs> It's me. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, I just want to go back to what I think um, Dr. Shields mentioned earlier about how the pandemic shifted the culture of attendance. I, I love attendance just as the next person. Um, so remember that Instagram and TikTok and wherever this is going to land. But <laughs> my concern <laughs> is these um, historically there were like rewards for perfect attendance and kind of pushing kids into school when they're sick and then we know they're gonna transmit their cold, flu, whatever to their desk mate. And that's kind of not ideal as a parent, you know, <laughs> when the whole class gets the flu and then uh, you're missing work. So um, is that being kind of disaggregated in this work like a channel for if someone has um, a number of uh, excused absences, are they on this same letter path or is it a different path that they get put on? And also, um, is there a way to compare districts? Because all those comparisons of districts were just like the straight up number of um, attendance versus non-attendance and that factors into my understanding um, excused as well. So is there a way to compare across the districts just the unexcused to see how we're making progress just with that and not factoring in excused absences, which are illness, which um, we really don't want to force people into school. I think those important nuances are hopefully something even capital advisors can speak to. I think the, the way the state is framing attendance in schools right now is largely problematic because it's such a broad swipe and the specificity of why students are out because no, we couldn't dig into other people's data. We can barely mm -hmm. dig into our own because <laughs> The topics are so broad, like excused, unexcused illness, and then it's kind of like other. Mm -hmm. So even kind of getting deep into our data takes focus groups mm -hmm. and us coding differently and all of these things. And we certainly don't have that level of access to other students. But it is that issue that is one of the reasons why I believe I, we've had the discussion before about attendance across the state mm -hmm. and how many districts fell into the compliance issue because of, because of attendance. Because to your exact point, na sniffles used to mean like wipe it off and keep going. And now it's like, oh, OK, you'll stay home today. And because we know schools, those are closed rooms. I mean, we've all known they swipe, go through a classroom. Teachers know very well. You know, it just has been what it is. And we just feel differently today as a broad community, not even just our district, but as a broader mm -hmm. community, that that is reason to stay home. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the state will do, but I certainly know that many districts have brought forward the idea that it's clear you told us to have people stay home if they were ill. People are still staying home because they're ill. And now they're counted in these numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so two smaller questions. So does our district still give rewards for kids with perfect attendance? Is that still rewarded? From my experience, it's more of a like in, an improvement in attendance. And so you haven't been absent as much. It's not okay. so much on the you haven't missed any school days because we know that kids are sick and we're asking kids to stay home because they're sick. Yeah. But it's, a, it's an area that we continue to refine and improve on, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a culture shift of perfect attendance used to be something that people were striving for, right? Mm -hmm. And so really shifting mindset to we're really looking for kids who are coming to school when they can and who are improving when maybe they were struggling before. And we also are looking more deeply at our data. And it is interesting that potentially people are more sick on Mondays and Fridays. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
<laughs> really like that home yeah. was very convenient. <laughs> so, I mean, like it's, you know, it's all woven together. Totally, totally true. And one last question, if I can, um, to the student board members point about mental health. I know some districts have like two excused mental health days. Do we do that? So the Ed Code has recently been updated to include mental health days as an excused absence reason okay. under illness. And so okay. we actually have a requirement that okay. if a parent calls in and says my child is taking a mental health day, that it is coded as an illness or an excused absence. Okay. And is there a limit to that? Or is it numerical or is it just? So we do require after a 10th day of an illness absence okay. that we do need a note. And so mm -hmm. if, it, if those other absences were without a doctor's note. So okay. after that, and it's more because if a student has a medical issue or there's something we need to know about, we want to make sure there's that communication back and forth. Okay, thank you. And how are we communicating that? Or, I mean, Jose seems surprised to hear that. So. <laughs> um, so we did recently update our handbook. And so our student and parent handbook for this year was updated as far as our attendance policy and all of the ed codes are included in there. And I think that would be an area for us to continue to improve upon is getting that message out in other types of formats other than just the handbook is how are we communicating that to our students and our families that these are the reasons why students can miss school and then here is very clearly what our policies are behind that. So work in progress. I wonder if that could be something that we put like either in bathrooms or because I know what the holidays and then finals like those are the like most high stress, high stress. times mm -hmm. so for students to just be aware I need a day off mm -hmm. I need you know so I think that could be really helpful to implement quickly um, I love the um, the not SARB anymore SART at Melinda Hogue how did that come to be, the student attendance being so hosted? SARB is at Melinda Hoag. Oh, it's, so it is with the B now. It's with the, the B, B so it's, the, it's okay. the Student Attendance Review Board, which is facilitated by district staff, and then we have a variety of, of people who come from the community there. And it really was just, again, as we explored what's going to be the best environment for our families as they come to these meetings, because they're high stress. Right? It's, it's a serious meeting to have to come to, and sometimes coming to the district office doesn't feel the most supportive to every family, right? As much as we try. But bringing a family to the resources versus referring them out just really felt like it made the most sense for our family. So let's take them and put the meeting where the resources are so that they can connect immediately versus them having an additional thing that they need to go do after the meeting. Yeah, I love that so much. Um, and then I was wondering for the um, alternative to suspension. I'm also very excited about that. Do how many students have we had that have gone through that this first kind of semester? Sure. So I believe the last time I checked, I think we're at uh, over. A, I, don't, I don't want to speak. You might we've uh, we've recovered 156 days. Um, at the end of October. So 156 days of suspension and on any given day, we have about 10 to 15 kids in the program. Wow. So on the first uh, two days of school, we thought we'd be empty and we had one or two. Um, <laughs> And then it grew a little bit. And so um, in talking with Dr. S uh, Stevens, it's about 10 to 15 kids. Thank you. That's really helpful information. And then I was wondering also, as we were communicating, I know um, at times and maybe in our past, because we're basic aid and not ADA, mm -hmm. average daily attendance, a lot of people have thought, well, it doesn't matter because we're not getting paid per seat mm -hmm. per student, as a majority of other districts mm -hmm. are. So um, are we, as part of this attendance kind of rollout in the postcards, are we also communicating that piece to folks? We are, and in the messaging that goes out district-wide to all parents, it's really the focus on your students need to be in school to learn, right? And they need to be there to get the information within their classroom directly from their teachers. Um, some students maybe are able to learn a little bit more independently, but then we're also looking at how students are building relationships and how they're building their friendships and how are they connected to school. Because it's not just about coming to learn, it's about how are they coming and being involved in their extracurricular activities and finding opportunities to further themselves as individuals. So it's not just about we don't get money because your student comes to school because we get the money anyway. It's about this is for the best experience and the best development of your child, is for them to be here and to have a variety of different experiences to help further them in their life as they become young adults. Thank you. And I love the door hangers. I think that's amazing. It's nice that they're supportive rather than like, where were you? Mm -hmm. I think that really is a helpful tool. Um, Trustee Wagon. I just had one clarifying question. On the um, 
for tier two, where it's the 10 to 15 day early in, or 10 to 19 day, or 10 to 19 percent of days enrolled in school, um, does this also include like the un, or the excuse? So, say I get a lot of um, questions from constituents who their kids have been traveling for you know fun reasons or mm -hmm. whatever else, and they say, hey, I'm now I'm getting one of these letters. Mm -hmm. What about that? And you know, obviously, we would prefer those people to travel during the breaks, but we. Will that still go through the same early intervention where, you know, they sit down with the parent, the parents and then the counselors and teachers to talk about the importance of staying in school sure. during so that time? Sure. So each case there for Tier 2 would be individualized. And so the type of absence drives the type of letter. So not every family receives the same type of letter. So if it's excused absences, then they would be receiving that excessive excuse. If it's just chronic absenteeism, so we know maybe they were on a vacation and maybe those absences were unexcused, they would get that chronic absence letter. And then if it was truancy, which we don't have the reason, we don't know why they're there, that's kind of, for us, it's our highest tier of the type of absence that it could be. And so depending upon the reason, if we're seeing a, like an excessive amount, they may do that, that start meeting at the school just to talk about what can we do to work together. Typically, it wouldn't be based just off of a vacation or two. It's usually there's that. Plus, there's other things, and the students just happen to be out of school a lot more. And so we want to work together with the parent to see what we can do to get them back into school. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It is also part of why we're doing the short-term independent study, because that's an option to reclaim some of those days when it's not severe illness and the student could be doing those things. But yes, even traveling frequently would warrant some type of letter because, again, it, the reason does not matter. It's the mere absence from the classroom. So again, that is a different shift. That is a new mindset because it used to kind of be, well, if it's excused, ah, no harm, no foul. But now, like all of them count together because you need to be in school to learn. That is a basic premise we have. Appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, do, do you have another question? Okay, yes, Trustee Bartel. Uh, to dovetail on to Trustee Wigand's question, a lot of, at the high school level, a lot of the questions I get are from student athletes who are traveling to participate in nationals in one sport or another. Um, so that would follow, fall under the unexcused absence category? It, it can. It depends. Again, there is uh, there is an option if they want to work with the school site, and sometimes those absences can be excused. Okay. That would be a great opportunity for us to offer that short-term independent, independent study, study because then they could still be doing their work, and then when they come back and show evidence of that work, then those absences then would no longer be there because they'd be cred getting credit for doing that independent study. That, that's great. And what, would they contact their counselor or their teacher or the principal at the high school level? They can contact the assistant principal. They can contact their counselor. Everyone's aware that that's an option. And so whoever they're working with at the school site would be the person they can contact. Thank you. That's so helpful. It's probably the number one question that I get um, after, you know, the bathroom height cleanliness. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you very, very much. Oh, All right. Now Thank you, team. Yeah. <laughs> now we'll move on to item 18, our legislative and state budget update. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I skipped one. Oh. Just a moment, Kevin. Sorry, I skipped ahead. Number 17, <laughs> reports. The report on debt issuance and management. Mr. Trader. So in accordance with uh, Board Policy 3470, staff shall come to you once a year to report on the um, annual, uh, on the debt issued by the district. And uh, uh, Jason Chung with our min municipal advisor, uh, Fieldman Rollap, has prepared a report on this that I promise will be much more fun than the ants in your pants right now, so. <laughs> I promises, I'll try my best. Um, are you able to, um, oh, there we go, great. Enlarge that. Great, well, good evening, board members, Superintendent Smith. I am Jason Chung with Fieldman Rollap and Associates. We are the district's municipal advisor. It's probably around this time last year where I last pre presented an update to the board on its GeoBond program. So tonight I have an update on your assessed value as well as some potential funding options for the future. And slide two is the district's historical assessed value. And since 1981, this is about as stable and consistent a profile as any of our clients. Um, assessed value is really just another way of saying your taxable value in your district. It's much uh, different than the current market value. It's typically much lower than that. 
And just like an investment portfolio, we'd like to see really strong year-over-year -year growth. And so um, really since the Great Recession, you can see it's been very consistent um, in the 5 to 8% ranges, exactly what we want to see. That helps um, entrust that the future tax rates for your community will be lower than what we project. And we have over four decades of data from 1981 to show that the district's taxable value on average has increased by about 6.2%. In fiscal 23, the district grew by 7.8%. In the current year, the district grew by 6.27%. And so pretty soon, maybe as early as next year this time, the district will exceed that $100 billion assessed value figure. That puts you in a very rarefied air, very a small group of school districts that are that size. Um, and then when we look at your long-term averages from five years all the way to 40 years in the past, nearly all of them are in that 55 to 6% range. So again, very consistent. The chart on the bottom right is the district's bonding capacity, and this is something that all school districts have to monitor. And so the rule is you take 2.5% of your current assessed value, so 2.5% of $94 billion would be $2.35 billion. That $2.35 billion is the legal amount that the district can have outstanding in principle on the books. As of today, the district just has under $216 million. So you have a very low debt burden, considered a very low debt burden on the community. And slide three is an overview of the tax rate projection on all of the district's outstanding bonds. The first authorization was called Measure A. This was approved in 2000. And the second bond authorization was called Measure F, approved in 2005. And normally when you pass a bond measure, the new bond tax rates are added on top of what is currently being repaid. However, Measure F was sort of unique where it actually had a promise to the voters that we would not ex they, we would not increase the um, amount of tax rates, but merely extend the rate that was currently being paid. And that rate at that time was $18.87. And so Measure F um, limits all bonds of Measure F and Measure A to that $18.87 projection. So you can see we have uh, different colored series of bar charts. These all represent different series of bonds. Most of them, as of today, have been refinanced. So we've actually refinanced four times in the last 12 or so years. And the district has about $88 million, le $88 million left of unissued authorization that, that it can access as long as your tax rate can support it. And so that red horizontal line is the $18.87 per 100,000 limit. And you can see your outstanding bonds are really up against that limit until year 2039. And so the, the ways to access that are to have your assessed value grow considerably higher than our projection, or um, you, the district uses some um, other forms of financing that are pretty cost, cost um, uh, not cost effective compared to current interest bonds, and so we would not recommend that at that time. Um, and then for the next slide, this shows the lineup of the district's five series of bonds outstanding. I mentioned the four refinancings that were done. That has delivered over $150 million in taxpayer savings to date. On the far right is next call date. Those are the dates when the bonds can be refinanced, kind of like your typical home mortgage. And so we've done a lot of refinancings most recently in 2020, so the next opportunity would be in year 2027, and we've continued to monitor that. Slide five is the current year chart of the district's bond taxes in comparison to every other school district in the county. As you can see, uh, the top one is Los Alamitos. It's $71.80 per 100000 And Newport Mesa is the third lowest. You're charging the third lowest amount in the county at $16.30. So about $2.5 below the $18.87 projection. And so that's, that's great news. We're charging less than what we actually promised to voters. And that's all thanks to the strong assessed value that you've seen in your community. And uh, we do have a presidential election coming up next year in November. And so a good amount of these districts will be going out for bonds. And that's going to push that median rate up. Currently, it's at $30.85. But once new bonds are passed, uh, new debt is issued, that rate will likely go up. But as of now, these are, well, these are where the standings lie. And then on, for information purposes, we ran an analysis on what the district could generate for a new authorization in 2024. And we wanted to follow a similar structure to Measure F, where we not have an additive tax on top of what's been already paid off, but really trying to wrap around what's already been issued. And so this is meant to illustrate that the light blue bars are your Measure A and Measure F bonds that are costing about that $18 tax rate limit. But we wanted to see what if we did a new promise to the voters. What if we said we, are, we, we pledge to stay below the county medium of $30 per 100000 and that extra $11 of capacity 
results in about $295 million of additional funding from 2025 to 2031. And on the next page, just for reference, we wanted to see if the district had grown at the same rate at, that it has been in the past 30, 40 years, 5.5%, what amount that could be generated. And that increases from $295 million to $395 million. And so we probably would recommend this level of growth when the district actually sells bonds. But for projection purposes, I think this is what the district could generate based on what it has grown in the past. And so again, this, these are conservative options. Typically, when we look at new bond authorizations, when school districts go out for new bonds, they are directly additive on top of what's being paid. However, this would limit all uh, previous, current, and future bonds to a $30 limit. And this slide shows the passage rates of all Proposition 39 bonds uh, since February 2008. And you can see March 2020 was quite the outlier, 36% passage rate only for that year. And that was an outlier for a number of reasons, mostly uh, stock market dropped about 13% two weeks before election day. COVID cases were just starting to appear in the U.S., so there was a great amount of uncertainty in the community and, and throughout the nation. And so when uncertainty is apparent, um, the support for raising taxes evaporates by a great amount. But you can see we've had three elections since that time, and the success rates have rebounded right back to those historical levels in the 70 to 80 percent range. But I, I'd like you to focus on those green colored dots in 2008, 12, 16, and 20. Those are your presidential year elections. And you can see more often than not, uh, the support for those Prop 39 bonds are much higher than your non-presidential years. And for those districts that are considering going out in November 2020, this is the typical kind of process that they would follow. And the first step would be to get an independent feasibility study completed, otherwise known as a voter opinion survey or a poll. And this not only helps you identify what tax rate you'd likely be most, um, have the most success at on election day, but it also helps identify the most important issues of need and critical funding need that are important to your community. And so that helps the, you strategize and get the information out and focus on those specific ideas. Uh, the second piece of the phase would be um, most districts commonly hire what's called a communication consultant. This is a strategic firm that helps you um, really get the, get the information out and communicate the level of funding need to the community. They take information from that survey and help you produce FAQs, fact sheets, help you uh, have stakeholders, help you hold stakeholder meetings with those groups to build consensus for that. Uh, the bottom is the deadline for the board action for a November 2024 bond. In order to make that November bond, um, the district would have to pass a resolution calling election by August 9th of 2024. That's 88 days prior to election day. And finally, this is just a typical kind of schedule for a district that would be considering a November 2024 bond. Uh, many districts have done surveys um, in October or November. We would like to avoid November, December if we could. A lot of people are on vacation. They're not interested in answering voters surveys. So in January 2024, many of our districts that haven't gone out yet would likely conduct polls at that time, um, have received results in February, and then pre present, re present the re uh, results of the survey at their March meeting. Assuming those results are positive at the March meeting, then you, the board would typically give a go-ahead for the bond council attorneys to provide the project list, the draft resolutions, and that would have a board meeting um, at the first reading at the May meeting. That would really be for the board to provide comment and feedback. And then on the second meeting in June, that would be the actual board date where governing boards would be asked to approve the resolution calling election. It uh, gives us plenty of wiggle room before that August 9th deadline because a lot of school districts don't hold meetings in July. So we typically look at the first or second board meeting of June for that timeline. But um, whenever a good deal of information, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you. We have questions? This is really helpful information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good night. Okay. And um, next, now we have Kevin um, from Capital Advisors for our Legislative Analyst Update and Fiscal Outlook. Great. Awesome. It's good to be with you. See, I don't see a speaker. You guys can hear me, though. Built in, oh, I was just yeah. make sure you Awesome, very good. <laughs> Playground boys. Madam President, members of the board, it's good to be with you all. Um, so 
I know you guys have a lot of things on your agenda, so I'll try to be as brief as possible, but then open it up to questions. It's this board, the leadership of this district, that decided some time ago that it was a good idea to have a voice for this district talking about some of the issues that are unique to this district in Sacramento, also raising those with our California delegation. Um, you guys have been active here as well as the board directly involved with advocacy back in Washington, D.C., and I've, I've been honored to help kind of Sherpa you when we've been back to Washington. And I think we're going to be doing some more of that that looks like it's going to be exciting in some of the conversations we've had. But I wanted to bring you up today just on state-based issues, where kind of where we sit right now, kind of an important part time of the year. It would be actually more important time of the year if we actually had any data from Sacramento, and we don't. Uh, they do op operate sometimes in a data-free environment. That's dangerous. Uh, but right now, as you guys all know, is the feds moved the tax filing deadline, and then they did it again. So we were looking at October to try to figure out what the revenue picture looked like because it absolutely is hooked to the well-being of school finance. What we get in state revenues matters. It's a formula for what you get in districts. And I know you get this, but to make sure that we're bringing our audience along uh, as I talk about this a little bit, it's good for everybody to know. So what was anticipated is the legislature, first time in my career, where the legislature adopts a budget and actually starts cutting checks to everybody at the beginning of this fiscal year without having any idea what revenue they're going to get. It was a guess. And the guess was predicated, they were trying to be conservative, but they said, in order for all this to balance, we need personal income tax to generate about $42 billion. And on the, around the 15th of October, which was that first deadline, happened to land on a Sunday, so really it's that Monday that they, we would have been slicing open envelopes. And on that very day, the feds announced they were moving the deadline to November 15th. So I'm thinking to myself, it's a classic move by government at that level to punish all the people that follow the law and maybe not the people that don't. Everybody who intended to file their taxes filed them, right? That was tax deadline day. So people that had no intention of filing their taxes get another month. So they get like extra time. Well, I, I have a funny feeling that the very, very, very wealthy people that make, you know, more in a day than I'll make in a year, <laughs> have some sort of lead because it looks like there were a lot of tax filers that did not file on that date and took advantage of that November date. But some of you I know have heard, as we've talked at CSBA and other places, Jack O'Connell always outlines that 50% of the personal income tax paid in California is paid by the top 1%. Very wealthy people, and most of it is earned on the stock market. It's investment income, right? And so that means if for the rest of us we paid our taxes on time, you would think the other 50% of the 42 billion would be in. But they only got to $18 billion by the end of October. That's a problem. So what we think is their estimate are going to be off. And that has implications for all of school finance to some degree. Just makes us a little nervous. So We'll see what happens. Normally this time, this week, the nonpartisan legislative analyst does a big fiscal analysis that becomes the building block for the governor to put his budget together. And they just announced today, because it was going to be out on Thursday, that they're moving it to second week of December, try to get a better handle on what the data looks like. And by then, they actually will know. We think by Thanksgiving, we'll see all the numbers. And what we're hoping is people that did very well <coughs> did very, very well, and they'll make up for what this shortfall is, and we'll get to the $42 billion, but we'll see what happens. So all that revenue stuff drives what happens. The one little piece of this that's really good for us all to know is that under Governor Jerry Brown, and there's you know, <laughs> things I had difference of opinion in and some that I really miss him because he paid attention to debt issues a lot, <coughs> is that he helped create the Rainy Day Fund for Education. That Rainy Day Fund now has $12 billion in it almost universally believed to absolutely get us through the next year, almost no matter how ugly things get. So I just want you to know, there's, there's a lot of unknowns. Things could be worse than we might think. But for schools, we'll be really insulated. The non-school part of the state budget is going to be potentially in trouble almost no matter what. 
So I just kind of mentioned that. And then lastly, the other implication for you guys that's important is the cost of living allowance, the COLA. That's that allowance that we get across programs every year that help us keep pace with inflation. And you guys have heard me say this, that some people in Sacramento want to pat themselves on the back when they give you a cost of living adjustment. And I always say that only pays for the thing, same things you're doing this <coughs> year, next year. It doesn't give you a bunch of money to do more. It lets you do what you did this year, another year. The estimate for that COLA, that cost of living estimate, this time a year ago, they were projecting that when we get to July 1 of next year, and we try to budget on this, the COLA would be around 5.6, uh, 5.7%. I just had a conversation with them today. They will put in their report probably in the first week of December, second week of December. They now think it'll be about 1%, which is a startlingly low number. And so the, the, the key issue there is for us not to have used the guess about next year to make commitments now is it the districts that have been careful and not overextend them. Now, we did get a big coal in the current year, 8.22%, and that was big, bigger than we've ever gotten. But one, it's weird, it's talk about weird circumstances. So last year's COLA, the COLA actually we're getting in the year that we're in, was 8.22%, the largest COLA cost of living increase year over year we've ever seen in my whole career, and it's been a long time, I assure you. And... Um, if we do get 1% next year, it'll be the lowest COLA that we've ever gotten by formula in my entire career. Now, there are years, that, and I know Wes remembers this, when we've gotten zero or they cut the COLA. Those are self-inflicted wounds. I'm talking about when you use the formula that we use, what's the highest it's generated, what's the lowest it's generated, one year the highest, the next year the lowest. It underscores the volatility of school finance that we always have to be careful, even though a whole bunch of people that probably stand at this podium and want you guys allocating money for all kinds of stuff without regard to the fact that you have that fiduciary obligation to sort of mine the bottom line, being careful matters. And you've been validated, the behavior of this district has been validated by some of these numbers when I think a lot of people would want to push you to spend more money. So I wanted to make sure you got that. The other thing is that's unique for us in Newport Mesa is when we talk about COLA, a lot of districts care about it relative to LCFF, the local control funding formula. And that obviously is a, as a community funded district, the implications for you are completely different. But they're important because it's the same cost of living adjustment that's applied to all other programs that you do get funded for. So categorical programs and I think the COLA on special ed, all of these kinds of things. We as a district need to care about that number. So when it is way lower than expectation, it's disappointing. On the good news side, and some of the financial people that were up here a second ago will say the good news side, it means they'll think inflation was running low. Your costs aren't going to be as high. Well, the problem with that assumption is that the COLA we get, the cost of living index we live by, is actually not related to the expenses in education. It's the market basket of goods and services purchased by state and local government. It has nothing to do with our increased expenses. So I guarantee you, if we had an index that reflected our cost increases, it would be way higher than 1%, way higher. But we don't. So it may be when we receive this historic low it might trigger a conversation that I think is long overdue about the cost of living index that we use in California to measure what does it take to stay even from one year to the next, that we really do at some point have to have that conversation. So I wanted to mention that. That's kind of fiscal backdrop. And feel free to ask questions. I'll try to breathe in a second, but I'm going to give you a couple more little pieces. Obviously, a lot of legislation. We concluded the legislative year. <coughs> We're in the middle of a two-year session. So that means they're going to come back in January, and they're going to pick up where they left off, and then we'll see where we end up. But in this one year, you know, there were notable things that happened, including some notable vetoes of legislation that were, again, it was the voice of school board members, and I know you guys were involved with this. The district was involved with sort of giving voice to this issue about issues like, for instance, and you guys now know it now, the sort of famous 
1699, AB 1699, this was the legislation that would have said you basically need to just hire all internally. First right of refusal of everybody inside, including, and I know some of the sponsors of the bill won't like this description, but including people that are not qualified for the job. Because when you read the details of the bill, it basically said you have to offer this to people. And if they're not qualified, and they can become qualified through training, that by the way, you'd be on the hook to do another unfunded mandate, then you need to give them the job. One of the things about this legislation, thank goodness it ended up getting vetoed, was what, what you guys are doing because you're a merit district and you've got a personnel commission, it would have otherwise undermined that fundamental mission, which is to say, we're going to actually hire qualified people. And we're going to go out and we're going to give people that are our labor partners in other districts and anybody and everybody that's qualified to be the best and brightest this district can recruit. We want to do it that way. We don't <coughs> want to do it this way. And I think the governor saw the sensibility of this and ended up vetoing the bill when people kind of put in front of him, does this really make sense? And so he ended up vetoing that. The other bill that was important was uh, vetoing 799. This is a Portantino bill, Senator Portantino from Pasadena, that would have said, hey, let's go ahead and give unemployment benefits to striking workers. And again, our labor partners, I get that it's their job every day when they wake up is what have we done for labor lately? Let's try to get some gains. And that's where that bill came from, of course. I just humbly think that would have actually spurred strikes. Because if there's no consequence, that no sacrifice to go out and strike, people say, well, it doesn't matter because I'm going to get paid something, so let's do it. Is it. I just think there would have been more tendency to go out and do that when there otherwise wouldn't be. And the governor saw fit to say, you know what, that probably is a little too much. Let's, let's not approve that bill. So he vetoed that legislation. So again, <coughs> organized labor is very strong for a reason in California. And we've got you know, these overwhelming majorities of Democrats in both houses and in the governor's office. And when it comes to labor, they're a major, major core constituency of, of the Democrats that hold power in Sacramento. I'm not a fan of one power rule by either party because I think it tends to result in overreaching. But those were a couple of bills where they said, Let, let's probably not do this, <coughs> not good public policy, and they didn't. Um, and then there's issues with regard to staffing that we worked on that were really positive, and we compliment CTA because they actually helped us on this one. And that was getting legislation through that said, hey, we need to extend the amount of time we have subs in the classroom because otherwise that 30-day requirement currently <coughs> in law needs to be 60 days. It worked better. It should be actually, in my view, longer. I actually think there ought to be a little more local control on that issue. But in statute, it doubled the time. We're going to extend that into next year, and that's a good thing. And again, we're having trouble with that for the longest time, and then CTA said no, that it actually makes sense. And once they sort of gave the high sign, then the legislature followed suit, and we were able to get that. That was done in trader bill language with the legislature. And then the other piece of legislation was SB 765, that was a good bill by Senator Portantino that ended up relaxing some of the rules around earnings caps for employees so they could actually come back. I totally get it that we don't want people who come back into education only to game the system and make their retirement bigger. But the way the system works right now, they actually get penalized. If they come back and we need their help and we're in the, minute, the, in the midst of a crisis from a stand, staffing standpoint, we ought to be able to use that wonderful talent, people that are committed to this district, without them being penalized, for goodness sakes. And this bill helps take off some of that pressure. It, it, it eliminates or modifies that 180-day mandatory <coughs> sit-out period, and it lifts some of the earnings cap issues. Both of those are really good ideas. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about Prop 28. So. Um, Obviously, that funding now, the, the, the CDE took its time and just got the funding determinations out, I think, just a week ago. So we have estimates for what districts across the state are going to be actually eligible to receive. The one issue you guys have given a lot of voice to, we've had conversations about it, is this issue that I think we have to be a little aggressive about, which is the supplement versus supplant issue. And that is this board ought to have the latitude to look at programs and say, if it's funded 
with one in the past by one time money or grants or something that you got that was very temporal that and you make a commitment to use this money to fund that that that's supplemental not supplanting and that you ought to be able to do that you ought to be able to backfill that one time opportunity if you did that with arts and music and be able to fund that and not get penalized because you maybe did the right thing with one time money and we've got some strategies on how to do that and one of them starts with I was asked today about us as a firm giving a formal opinion that you guys can use. It's not anything you're going to get nailed on by auditors because the law simply doesn't speak to it. So in the absence of law on this issue, it's really up to the district to develop its own sense of rationale on this. And I think with our help giving you guys a formal opinion, I think we ought to do the same with CSBA. We ought to do it with some of the other district associations and get them to put opinions together that insulate you from any potential jeopardy if you want to actually follow suit with that. So that was that issue. And then finally on block grants, there were a couple areas. That, that Prop 28 was really important that the distribution was not going to be based on LCFF for this district, but in fact it was going to be based on, it, on your ADA, your enrollment. Um, and we did, that was successful. That is the way the distribution is so that this district doesn't end up having like too many other pots of money, bidding at a disadvantage that way. But the same with the block grants that were in the budget last year, you guys all know, and then again, this district gave voice to the issue of don't cut in the middle of the fiscal year, these block grants that you committed to us. This board sat in front of your community and made commitments to things. Then when the state decides they might cut it in the middle of the year, they never understand that it was the state that did it. They'll think you're the ones that backed out of commitments when they cut you in the middle of the year and you have to cut programs. So that ended up being persuasive and they ended up backing off those mid-year cuts to the tune of three billion dollars that they wanted that they did not get, the governor wanted. And it, frankly it was the legislature and David Min and other people who really spoke up for this issue about not wanting to cut those block grants knowing what would do to you guys mid-year. So in the worst budget year we've had in 12 years, and they didn't have a lot of tools at their disposal, we were able to still defeat that proposed cut. So you guys ended up much, much better off. And the other thing that was good for this district in particular is that I was looking at the two pots of money that they could cut. One of them was the art, music, uh, and instructional materials block grant, which you get. The other was the learning opportunity block grant that was out there, the learning recovery block grant. That money went principally to districts with super high unduplicated counts. You got much less of that money, if any of it. We wanted to make sure that they didn't, which is typically what we've seen historically, they typically go after the pot that you would get and do a lot less cutting to the other one, and it, they flipped it. So they cut a lot more out of the learning recovery block grant, significantly more out of the learning recovery block grant, and really left once we got done with doing that first apportionment out, you know, you got about 90% of that block grant you ended up hanging on to, which was really a good thing. So it's always important that we look at these school finance issues through the lens of when they have a decision to make, what's that decision we can be active on that understands that nuance of the way this district's characteristics are. And being a community-funded district is part of that as we look into it. So I think I'm going to stop there and then just see if you guys got the whole, the whole speech done. See if you guys have any questions. I see you look eager, but no one's pushing the button. <laughs> Trustee Weigand. Um, quick question. Thank you for all that informative information. Um, historically, we have, or in the past, we wrote letters supporting um, our funding for Universal TK, and we still have not received any money or funding for that. Right. I just wanted to see where we are yeah. with it's a great that funding. Issue. First of all, and we've, we have talked about this briefly, and I really appreciate you bringing it up because we do need to make sure we're raising it. It should be, again, a top priority next year. We should be giving voice to this issue, and just so everybody gets it, is that you guys have done something unique, and there are a lot of community-funded districts, and I know that people don't quite get all of that, but the bottom line is, is that for a very small handful of districts, and this is one of them, 
that by virtue of the fact that a majority of your funding comes from the community, not the state, you get penalized all over the place all the time when they're creating opportunities for children. It's just wrong. When the governor stood up and said, I'm going to make a commitment to funding every single four-year-old for early education in the state, and he's willing to pay for it, he kind of forgot that there were districts like this one that didn't get included. It basically is one of those things where it's our job to make sure we're reminding policymakers in Sacramento, you did a major left out, and it's letting down a bunch of four-year-olds down in this part of the state that we need to try to make up for. We need to figure out that. The timing last year wasn't good because, again, the worst budget we'd seen in 12 years. It wasn't a time to try to initiate anything that spent more money. It was all about blocking cut, you know, any of the proposals to cut. What I was hopeful, if you take a look at revenue, kind of the revenue track since the budget was adopted, there's actually been several months when we've had kind of good news other than this whole problem that on October 16th, the money didn't come in in October, we thought would. But I think there's still a chance, depending on what rich people do, <laughs> that if we get into a trajectory where there's more revenue than we thought, that's something we all should care about. Because it'll be that marginal difference in revenue that then we can have a debate about what do you do with that. This should be at the top of that list. Is that make, and it's not a new, pro we're not asking the governor to go out and fund a new program or a new thing that's beyond what we're doing in the base. We're saying m stay true to the commitment you made at a program you've already established. And for every other district in the state, it's permanent, ongoing money that also is increased for the cost of living uh, adjustment. And this district doesn't get any of it. Some of the districts that are community funded districts, reaction to it is, oh, what's the penalty if you don't serve those kids? The penalty is they take away the money they were giving you. Well, you're not getting any money. So there really isn't any penalty. This district took the bold step of saying, we realize we could probably get away with not doing, but we're going to do the right thing by these kids, and we're going to step up and do it. But we need to argue to get it funded. And that's going to be our job collectively and my job, too. Kevin, I'm, I'm wondering uh, on this topic, I, I'm sure that folks, you know, at the Capitol and the Horseshoe think, well, com community funded, I know what those kids look like. Uh, I, I would offer up they have no idea what our kids look like. Yeah. Uh, and they should come out and see our TK programs. I, I wonder if there's a way for us to invite uh, members of the administration out to do a tour yeah. and show them the students, the kids, and the families who are being served by this program that we self-fund. So I just want to put that out there, that if you think idea. you could organize something, yeah. we've got some great we programs to show you. Yeah, we should do that for sure. Trustee Barta. Um, there were a lot of bills, various sorts, that were for providing Narcan. Um, at school districts, yes. did any of those pass? Yes. Okay. So there is legislation, budget items that does provide, I think, a certain number of doses for every site. Um, it's not a whole lot, but there is some there. So yeah. And we've gone ahead and provided those for our sites. Is that something that they would fund, like retroactively, or would be sort of in the future if we needed to replace them? Yeah, I them? mean, it was put into the budget for the year we're in the middle of. Okay. So there should be resources there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Trust you, I get. I had another question about um, shade structures. I know that there's been funding for shade structures. Yes. So there was legislation, and it was AB 515. This was um, a bill that when you look at it, it actually contained legislation that was supposed to deal with the bureaucracy. It wasn't green money. It was red tape. And that's sometimes important. But when you looked at it, I'm not really so sure how much districts were really being challenged by the nuances of that bill everywhere. I'm not even sure this district would have that problem. But it had to do that if you were going to put up a shade structure, that path that you have, that kid travels to get to the shade structure, had a lot of mandates around the accessibility of that path. Again, it's all planning and that kind of, and the division of state architect, everybody has to get in and come in with their clipboard and decide whether or not you're doing it right. And all of that costs money. So they basically, the legislation was aimed at saying, let's get rid of all of those traps and really encourage shade structures. But under the um, Inflation Reduction Act, 
there's specific funding in that act that I believe covers, unfortunately you have to front the cost, but once you complete the shade structure right now in law, federal dollars, 30% of the overall cost of the project is eligible. And there are people we can connect you to who know those rules backward and forward who can access it. You guys are probably on top of that if you're looking at shade structures, but that's a nice big chunk of change. 30% is really pretty good. So yeah, that's definitely out there. Thank you. I have a question um, about the infrastructure. I know that's something we talked about last time and then also to hearing that, you know, just kind of like the bond update and potentials since we have a lot of aging structures. Do you hear anything from Sacramento yeah. about possibly funding a lot of the repairs that need to be done on a lot of structures? Yeah, one of the things that's problematic is that just as the presentation that you had before I got up, talked about what happened with local bonds all across the state. The timing of that March election and the failure of bonds, all a record failure of bonds. Because again, it's all about pocketbook issues. A voter goes to the polls, and if all of a sudden the bond's falling out of all kinds of financial sort of circumstances, as well as inflation happening simultaneously, you vote basically on what's happening with regard to that. So the timing was awful, but it also affected a statewide bond. I mean, I always really encourage districts that to understand that value proposition that doesn't exist for libraries or roads or sewers or water hookup or any other infrastructure, but for public schools, when you're willing to go to the community and say, we should pass a bond, you will double the amount of money roughly of every taxpayer's dollar because you'll access state money. But there does have to be state money there. And when they didn't pass a bond in March of 2020, it meant we got to wait. And so now there's conversation in the legislature about going in November of this coming year, 2024. I think the prognosis would be pretty good they would pass a bond, but they have to get there. And there's two house sort of rivalry going on, two different bills that would deal with this. One includes the CSU and UC, and the other doesn't. The other is kindergarten through community college, or I should say pre-K through community college. The other thing we're watching, by the way, on that bond is to make sure they don't create rules on accessibility to pre-K construction money that would block this district from getting any of it just because you're community funded, so we have to watch that. But I'm optimistic they'll get there. I was kind of shocked in a little presentation that Jack did last week with Almer Tsuchi, the chairman of the Assembly Ed Committee and the author of one of the bond bills, that they were not you know, they just weren't really as, as optimistic as I am about it. I wish they were a little more enthusiastic about it. But we got to get the governor on board. We got to get a bond. Those bonds are, you know, as much as $14 billion in size. And if we can pass that bond, it's modernization and new construction, which this district, you know, obviously would benefit by. So, yeah, we're Thank looking, you. looking for that. Yeah. That's very helpful. Do we have any other question? Any other comments? Thank you so right. much. It's great to be here. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. And next we have item 19, the consent calendar. Do we have a motion? So moved. Okay, moved by Second. Trustee Wigand. Second. Seconded by Trustee Ursulu. Do we have any questions? It's actually, it was actually, it was Oh, sorry, Bart, I switched Bartram it, sorry. <laughs> oh, I saw her mouth move. Do you have any questions? No? Okay. All right, roll call that. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Okay, it passes with a vote of 6 0. And we do not have anything on our discussion action. Calendar and so next we have um, number 20 informal reports. Dr. Smith. Yeah, so the theme tonight for me is heart. My wife tells me with my arthritic fingers, this doesn't look like a heart. <laughs> it means to be a heart. Um, I was at an event th with the retired teachers uh, chapter and it just made me think about how powerfully um, important our teammates are. This was a retired teacher that started to tell a story of going to an event 
and seeing some of his former students judging the event. And he started to cry, talking about his students. And it just moved me. That's the heart that our teammates have. Uh, and I'm so honored to work with all of them, retired and, and active, certificated classified management. Speaking of heart, I didn't want to say this earlier because I don't want it to be in response to things people said relative to public comment, but I do want to publicly say uh, that I appreciate the heart of Dr. Haley and his team and the work that they're doing at Corona Del Mar to bring that school together, to focus on the right work. And um, yes, just a ton of heart. Thank you to, to that team. Uh, love our schools. I, what, a week ago, two weeks ago, I'm losing track of time, yeah, two weeks cool. ago. Um, what an amazing event. We, we've got our Love Costa Mesa group that comes together, uh, 17 sites, uh, 500 people, um, <laughs> just doing work. They know that the environment kids learn in impacts their learning. And so they volunteer to come and do all this amazing work. And I got to say, this was on to my, my last one. Um, uh, there right alongside me was uh, President Anderson. Uh, on her knees, weeding uh, these garden beds. And um, I, I wanted to finally tonight just mention how much I appreciate uh, the leadership of President Anderson and the heart that she has, the character, the courage associated with that heart. Um, since she's been the president next week, not next week, next board meeting rather, um, we have a reorganizational meeting, which doesn't mean she couldn't run again and be the president again, but I'm just saying, uh, if she's <laughs> not, uh, given this is the last time she's been sitting by me here, I just want to tell her I thank her, I value her, her heart shown throughout. She's always been an advocate for inclusivity, making sure that the voices of all could be heard. Um, maybe small things to you, but big and impact. Um, things like having babysitting at these meetings so that community members who have children that want to advocate, but they can't just hire a sitter or bring someone in. They can bring their kids here. We'll watch them so those parents have a voice. I just think that's just such an amazing representation of that. Prioritizing those that maybe didn't have something. And, and these things took the vote of board members, all seven of them, but this is under her leadership. That we decided we we're going to pay for, they decided that we we're going to pay for field trips, science camps for all schools, because some schools couldn't raise the money to go. Uh, and, and this board under her leadership said that's not okay. All kids get to go. We looked at a weighted student formula because some schools can't raise as much money as other schools for other things. And so under this board's leadership and her presidency, we have a weighted student formula so that those with greater need get more of the district resources uh, and that makes a difference. Um, again, it's just been an honor to serve with her. Um, whether you've seen it or not, I certainly had, have. And um, it's just, it's been great serving with you. I just wanted to say that before it's over. Thank you. That was unexpected. I'd just like to say that I second that. <laughs> How cute. Thanks, Jose. Jose. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, all right, we will start with Trustee Weigand. Thank you. Um, so uh, this week, um, or this, the past three weeks, um, there's been a, I've visited some sites and, and, and got to see um, some new principals um, and see what they found at their school site that's great, good, and needs improvement. So um, that, that was awesome. And I was also um, able to see the influence of universal TK on some of our sites, one of which um, uh, Woodland, that is a site where most, um, you know, it's just TK through, through second. So there is a lot of need for, you know, some of that TK funding. Um, other things that happened, I, I was able to witness some great Veterans Day um, events at our school um, last week, and it was just great to see uh, kids bring their um, parents, grandparents, to the school site and um, have them talk about their experience being in the military. Um, and they were able to not only, in a, and this was at Mariners, but not only to um, have a full big assembly, um, but also to um, go into each class and tell their story. So that was really impactful. Um, and that's great. And then also there was uh, parent-teacher conferences. So hope those all went well for everyone. <laughs> They were okay for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Thank you. Um, it was a 
great month for me. Um, I mean, who doesn't love the Halloween boo blasts um, at the elementary schools? Uh, it was great seeing the Lincoln teachers had a surprise and did a, a surprise dance, the teachers and staff, um, and it was absolutely darling. Um, and I think the one that touched me the most was the haunted house that our transportation department did um, for our special needs kids in our district um, to bus them to our here to the district office and um, the haunted house that they did they must have taken them weeks to do and to hand out candy each and every one of them was there handing out candy I mean, it was a very, very special um, day and something um, that I really appreciated and love to be at. Um, I participate, participated in the Love Our School Days also. That's new to Newport Beach, but we had three schools that participated, and that was Harbor View, Lincoln, um, and East Bluff. And Carol and I made it to all three schools. Um, I look forward to that program um, growing in the Newport Beach area. Um, I know it's been in Costa Mesa for a while, um, and um, looking forward to it growing here in Newport Beach. Um, and I also got to go to a Veterans Day um, celebration at Harbor View, um, and it's great to see it at the elementary level. We usually see it at the high school levels, but to see those elementary school kids get excited and wearing their red, white, and blue, it's pretty special. Um, and that's it. We had some jogathons, and I'm looking forward to some more this week. Um, and it's just been a great month. Uh there are still ants, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, yes, uh, Jose, I did get to go to Battle of the Bells, too, so Costa Mesa did not do quite as well as we were hoping, but um, go Estancia. Um, but, uh, uh, right, uh, but it was really great to see the whole Costa Mesa community come out and support the game. So many families and kids and students there cheering on their teams. It was a packed house, um, so that was great. Appreciate all the staff that came out, and it was a nice, fun community event. Um, and thank you, actually, to our police officers. They were there, too, but they're gone now. But they also were there making sure everyone was safe, so thank you. Um, I did get to go to Teacher of the Year celebrating um, Christine Tipton from California and Amy Lewis from Sonora. Um, her whole family was there, or their whole family was there. They had two whole tables of, like, their entire family. So it was, uh, it was great to meet all of them, and they were so proud of Amy and Christine, and um, so to Wes's point, it's a great event. And I will say, um, the you know, it's a it's a Monday night. It's a long long evening. That's fine. Um, but the six minute videos of the teachers, all the teachers in the um, in Orange County, how much work they pour into their students and their. Um, and their schools and their student success and their dedication and commitment to successful outcomes for their students was like, I teared up a few times, honestly, for teachers who are not in our district. Um, but seeing how much, uh, what an impact they have on um, our students' lives and how the support from their um, administrators and their school, uh, their school staff um, is really very key to their success. So thank you, everybody, for all that you do. Um, I re recommend you all going if you want to cry over some videos about <laughs> teachers and how amazing they are. It was, it was a great event. And then um, I'm looking forward to going out to DC for the National Blue Ribbon School Ceremony for Early College High. That is going to be awesome. And then um, Frozen Junior is playing at Costa Mesa Middle School um, this weekend for all of you who have nothing to do Thursday, Friday, Saturday during the day and Saturday night. You can come see all four performances. It'll be great, so thank you. And after you see Frozen, go to Estancia <laughs> and see their production of Flowers for Algern Algernon? Algernon? Alger. Okay. Algernon. <laughs> um, a story of a mentally challenged man who becomes a genius through surgery, races against time to retain his newfound intelligence. According to Jose, it is a sad show about the nature of intelligence <laughs> and what it means to be human. And I think he's in it also. I am in it. And the 
Uh, it's also the 17th through 19th at Estancia. The tickets are on sale at the Estancia Drama website or at the door. General admission is $15. And um, we hope everyone can go and see that magnificent play. I will be in Boston, but I'm sure everyone else here will be here and can go and enjoy seeing Jose um, on the big stage. That's right. Come see, come see, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> Um, so one thing I got to participate, which is new to me, is Newport Harbor, their IB program, did their Theory of Knowledge senior presentations. That was really interesting to see. They start with a question, and they have just a few minutes to kind of answer that question using pieces of art or um, historical objects from throughout history. A lot of people chose modern things, but a lot of people chose ancient things to answer questions about um, Things like how do how does technology contribute to changing ideas um, and things like that? It was really insightful. Um, not, I go to a lot of sports activities, so this was a just a very different experience, and it was amazing. Um, and then one of my favorite things to do is participate in the Back Bay uh, senior exit interviews that they do at Back Bay High, and um, I was able to visit. The, there today for a couple hours, and I'll go back again tomorrow. Um, and I love doing it because there's a lot of students who have overcome some pretty amazing challenges and their attitudes and perspectives um, and their maturity through a lot of that and, and their confidence. You know, you can see that they, they've overcome a lot to um, be where they are and that they're very wise beyond their years. So I love doing that, and I'm looking forward to uh, going back tomorrow. Thank you. Yes, I get, I'm doing that um, in December, December 7th. I'm looking forward to it. I haven't done it before. Um, and I'm also very excited, yes, that Asancia won Battle of the Bell. Um, and I wanted to also, Carol, is Trustee Crane is not here, but she would be holding this up and reminding everybody about the Newport Mesa Schools Foundation um, teacher grant application is due December 1st. So teachers, please sign up. That is a great opportunity to get some um, extras for your classroom. Um, and I also was able to attend um, the Whittier Fall Fiesta, which was amazing. I think every single parent, every single family was out and they were there for probably about five hours. It was, a, it was from four to nine. Um, and it, we really thank the city of Costa Mesa for providing us lights at the last minute. That was really exciting and we're thankful for that. Um, and I was able to participate with Love Our Schools Day, as Wes said, um, Wes said at Whittier um, in their garden, and then also at Ray. Ray had um, three different church partners, and they had a huge Lego green wall that was set up. Like, there was a room that was basically a back storage area that I had never seen before. There's a lot of hidden nooks at Ray. <laughs> As, as maybe Gabe probably knows. So there's like very interesting spaces that can be used for students for um, expanded learning opportunities. It's very exciting to see that go up. Um, and then at Victoria, there were students that were there helping cleaning the windows, cleaning cobwebs, um, picking up trash. It was great. And Wilson, they redid their garden. Um, and then I also just wanted to um, say thank you for we received a lot of emails from people in the community um, about what um, some of the events that were going on at Cronin Del Mar High School. Um, one of the people who emailed um, to me, it was something that was really cool. I've, I've learned a lot about the Holy Land in probably the past 15 years um, and just the, um, the ability to have a stance of pro, pro, pro. You can be pro each of the parties and pro peace. And so one of the people who wrote um, an email to us ended it with salam, shalom, and peace. And I thought that is exactly what we are trying to teach our students. That's something that um, to have every single um, side represented and respected and also have a voice to me was really important. Um, and so I think um, going forward, I'm really excited that we are we have started the, an interfaith council at, at CDM, um, but I would like to see that continue at our other sites. We kind of, um, we did some of our human relations work with our task force, but there's a lot more to do. At different points, people in our community said we did not need that. 
um, to continue. And I think it's very evident um, from things that have happened over the past year that it's really, really important for us. And it's important for us to start it younger. So to start with our middle school students, so on every single secondary campus, having those conversations that are constructive um, and helping students see how they can have discussions and share differences and their backgrounds in ways that are respectful um, and productive and kind. So I think there's a lot more work that we need to do um, and I think now is the time um, for me. So that is all and we will adjourn our meeting at 8.32. Thank <laughs> you.